Good morning. It's Monday, September 11th. My name is Natalie Fanny Gonzalez. I am the chair of the Economic Development Committee. I am here today with my colleague, um, Council Member Marilyn Balkin, and we have our amazing guest, uh, Council Member Don Lukey. As you may know, we have four members on this committee, but two of them are running late. One of them is a council president. He's on council president duty. So he did inform me that he was gonna uh, be here about 10 minutes late. So he'll join us, join us as soon as he's available. Um, just to recap, uh, the economic development full session is already out. So we'll start today with the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation uh, business attraction in the office market uh, oversight, which is this panel in front of us. Then on October 9, we're going to have a discussion on business retention. Then on October 23rd, we have a discussion on the retail market, uh, followed by the second session on urban districts, including Olo's 2023 evaluation of the Bethesda Urban Partnership. On November 6, we're going to have a discussion on agro-tourism, and that session, very exciting session, is going to happen up county at the Agri at the Ag Historic uh, Farm Park uh, in Derwood. So that will be at 9:30 a.m. as well. And then uh, on November 16, we're going to have a discussion on economic opportunities in the sports and the sport uh, industry. Uh, followed by a uh, discussion on the restaurant sector, mostly about permitting. Um, I've been doing a tour with DPS around the county, and it has been really hard to hear the challenges that the restaurant sector um, is facing in terms of permitting, uh, not just with DPS, but also HHS. So I wanted to give you that preview. Uh, but today, as you all know, this is a very, um, important discussion and it's a follow-up really from our June 12th presentation on the first quarter of the Montgomery County Economic Indicators. Okay, uh, as much as I love Montgomery County and I think it's the best place in this nation because it is, you know, just not based on the location but the talent that we have in this county, we do have our challenges and we won't fix anything until we talk about it and be honest about the solutions that we may have. Um, that presentation that we had back in June in terms of job creation that we don't have compared to other places in the region, is, it wasn't great. So this is a follow-up on that. Um, we're gonna start with the office market discussion. And I am, um, you know, we as a committee, we're very honored to have all of you here today, industry leaders on this, on this area. Um, and I'm gonna, pass it to Ms. Uh, Marlene Malkinson so she can uh, kick off this panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we do have um, a, a staff report that was uh, prepared by Logan Anbinder, so I want to thank him for this great work. But because you have um, so many wonderful speakers, um, we're not going to present it today. So if you have any questions, um, let us know. But we want to move on to the other presenters here, um, starting with the planning department, who's going to give you some background data. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Bilal Ali, and I'm the real estate market researcher uh, in the Research and Strategic Projects Division at Montgomery Planning. Um, and my role here today is just to provide a sense of the status quo for the office market and help orient you all to the size and scale of it and, and the nature of the trends that have been affecting our, our county uh, over the past few years. Um, I think I have a slideshow. Um, I don't know if you... Is that on here? No, this is the business attraction. This is the, yeah, I'm going for it. So uh, I think we're going to pull up the slides uh, while I get started, um, but I think we have all the slides in the staff report, so I'll just get uh, get going here. Um, 
like I said, I'm Bilal Ali, um, and I'm just orienting you all to the market. Um, we have a roughly 1,500 uh, office buildings in the county according to CoStar, which is a private data vendor uh, that accounts for about 75 million square feet of office. Um, the vacancy rate as of the second quarter of 2023 was 16.5%, um, and the average rents uh, are $30 or $31 approximately uh, per square foot. Um, there has been some increase in the inventory since 2018, so over the past five years where it was roughly 72 million square feet, um, and the vacancy rate has increased, um, which is one of the reasons that we're all here today. Um, and rents have been relatively flat, although as we know, inflation um, has been increasing as well. And I think we have these slides now, so we can... It's, it's, it's a document, it's not a PowerPoint. So scroll. scroll, got it. Great, um, so here's our snapshot of the office market, um, as I mentioned, um, and Moving on, just wanted to sort of orient everybody to the types of office buildings that we have as well. Um, we have trophy office buildings, which are sort of newer, the highest end um, type of office building that we have. Here's the Abbasset Tower, which was recently delivered in 2022. Um, we also have traditional office buildings with relatively large floor plates. Um, this is an example from the Rock Spring area. We also have life science office that's a mix of office R&D and manufacturing. Um, medical office buildings uh, that you know are throughout the county and provide more local orient local services and businesses. Uh, we don't have a lot of data centers, but we have at least one in the Palenburg Cheney area. Um, and then there are smaller office condos as well. And you can kind of see how um, these buildings are broken out by class as well from these images. That's not really a scientific taxonomy, but generally class A buildings will have more features, more amenities, um, be in more desirable locations um, and charge the highest rents. Uh, B will be a little more in the middle of the road and C is sort of everything else. Um, so. Um, and just benchmarking our inventory to the rest of the region, um, you can see that the district has the largest inventory at nearly 169 million square feet, uh, followed by Fairfax County with a roughly 119 million square feet. Um, Montgomery County has 75 million, and then Prince George's has the smallest of those uh, jurisdictions on your screen with 30 million square feet of office. Um, and as you can see, the trends, the trends in rent uh, as well have been relatively flat since 2018. Um, the rents in DC are the highest at over $50 a square foot. Um, in Montgomery County and Fairfax are more or less in line with each other at 30 to $32 a square foot, um, followed by Prince George's County. And as I mentioned, um, these rents have not necessarily kept up with inflation. Um, and you know, the sort of big story, I think, is, is an office vacancy. Um, certainly there's an inflection point in 2020 where office vacancy rates rise um, faster than they had been before. Um, as of Q2 2023, our office vacancy rates are about 16.5%, which is in line with uh, the District of Columbia. Uh, Fairfax County, which has a larger office market, has a larger vacancy rate, um, and all three have been increasing since the pandemic, but also from be since before the pandemic, although the pandemic certainly accelerated um, that shift um, in, in office market conditions. Interestingly, Prince George's County has not experienced the same effect, um, in part due to the fact that it has a smaller inventory, but they also have some sustained economic development efforts that are, are worth examining further to understand how they've been doing differently than us. Um, I oriented everybody to the class mix in terms of what those buildings look like and what they offer and just wanted to give everyone a sense of what we have here in the county. Um, there are the, you know, the class A has the fewest buildings, just over 200, but the most space because those buildings tend to be the largest. Um, and class A will generally attract, you know, your, your largest businesses, your corporate headquarters um, and sort of your um, higher order tenants. Um, followed by Class B and C, which have um, less office space um, in this county. Um, and you can see here how rents and, and vacancy break out as well, to the extent that you know Class A buildings tend to uh, reflect more of the office economy in terms of economic development and job growth. Um, you can see how the vacancy rates are higher. There are also some newer Class A buildings that were delivered through the pandemic, as I'll show in a few slides, that are sort of elevating that vacancy rate, but it is more or less in line with the county average. Um, and then the vacancy rates are lower for class B and C, but the rents are also lower as well. Um, 
I'm going to show a few data points that break out uh, some of these metrics by geography, but just to get everybody a sense of how CoStar thinks of these markets, um, it's not really sensitive to jurisdictional boundaries, but it does carve up roughly with how uh, we consider the county. So you can see, um, you know, North Bethesda, Potomac is its own market, Bethesda Chevy Chase is its own market, and then Rockville. North Rockville, Gaithersburg is generally covering um, where life sciences would be, um, et cetera. And one caveat is that the I-270 North market, which is a very small submarket, um, does extend a little bit past Frederick County, but we remove the, product, uh, the properties in Frederick just to right size those numbers for you all today. Um, and this is how it breaks out um, in terms of the portion of inventory by geography. The top six markets account for 85% of the office inventory. Um, that's Bethesda, North Bethesda, Potomac, Rockville, North Rockville, Gaithersburg, and Silver Spring. Um, and Germantown has a roughly 4.5% of the office market as well. Um, the rents and vacancies tend to correspond with um, what you might expect. The rents are highest in Bethesda, uh, followed by sort of North Bethesda, Rockville, North Rockville. Um, outlying Montgomery County East, which would be only is somewhat of an outlier here, just given it's um, the small size of that market. Um, you know, Gaithersburg has slightly lower rents than uh, further down the 270 corridor, but also a lower vacancy rate. Um, and as you, as you can, you know, see the, the vacancy rates are relatively high, but as a Chevy Chase, which has a you know, concentration of Class A office building, does have a higher vacancy rate. There's also some new deliveries there, so we'll take a look at some of that in a minute. Um, but the vacancy rates are, you know, above county average. Similarly, in North Bethesda, Potomac, where we also have some Class A. Um, and then Germantown, which has a smaller um, more footprint, um, also has a relatively high vacancy rate, along with uh, lower rents as well. Um, this is not to. It's not doesn't explain all the the, the vacancy in, in Bethesda and Chevy Chase, but this this chart here shows deliveries and absorptions by each of those sub market. Um, and just to define those terms, deliveries is when a building typically is when a, a building receives its use and occupancy permit, it will be considered delivered, and so it's on the market and can lease up. And so that's what the blue bars are tracking. Whereas absorption is net leasing activity, so it's the difference between. Uh, net uh, occupying of space versus net lease, um, vacating of space. Um, and so as you can see, most absorption has been net negative. So uh, on the balance, um, tenants have vacated more space than they've leased um, in most markets. Um, but one of the reasons that there is a higher vacancy rate in, in Bethesda Chevy Chase um, is largely due, in fact, to the Avocet Tower that um, started construction prior to the pandemic, sort of bad timing uh, for when that was completed, and it's, uh, as of the last quarter, still 80% vacant and still leasing up. Um, so that's driving up the number a little bit. If you were to remove that, the number of the vacancy rate in Bethesda would fall to maybe 17%, which is still above the county average, but closer. Um, so the places where you have net positive absorption and deliveries include like North Rockville, where there's been some life sciences development. So that's kind of a sign of, of the strength of that industry in particular. Then you can see, of course, the impact of uh, the Wheaton headquarters in the Kensington Wheaton market as well. Um, and there are some office projects that are still going to deliver within the next a couple of quarters, um, including in White Oak, um, in Pike and Rose, uh, where Choice Hotels and Sodexo, I believe, are going, um, Twinbrook Quarter, which is in the city of Rockville, um, and then a couple of life science developments in Germantown and Gaithersburg um, are slated to deliver as well. Yes? Uh, just a question about um, the uh, co corporate headquarters. So the uh, Planning, Park and Planning, and Marriott. Um, so, is there is this the entire building or leasable space? I, I'm I'm confused about that. Uh, in the previous slide. In the previous slide. Yeah. So actually, um, that was mostly just to show why the delivery number was so high. But Marriott actually was sort of a net zero impact on absorption because it's a one you know one occupant. So that building is actually occupied 100 percent. And the same with the Wheaton, uh, the... Uh, yes, yes, that's right, too. Um, the thing is, the, the reason the absorption isn't as big is because it's the sort of the net um, leasing activity in all the buildings, and so there's a lot more buildings than just the ones that were delivered. And just to make a, a small yeah. corruption, yeah. on the Wheaton Park and Planning building, the lease part of that building is empty. It hasn't been leased. Everything else mm -hmm. is all government agencies, but we have failed as a county 
<laughs> to play something on the retail space. Right. Um, anyway, I had to say that. No, it's true. That, that is still vacant today. Um, so I know there was a discussion about that, I think, a couple of months ago, right? So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I understand. Um, I just wanted to make this point as well, which is interesting and important that office is an important but small component of our property tax base. Um, the assessed value of our, uh, of our is roughly 14.9 million, um, which accounts for about 6% of the total assessed value of the county, which is predominantly residential. So, you know, our economy is primarily residential. Office is important. Um, but, you know, what this really tells us is that we might be somewhat inoculated from some of the more fiscal impacts that places like the district or maybe even Fairfax County might, might face. Um, federal leases are an important part of the, the office uh, market in this county, as you all know. Um, it's roughly 7.3 million of, of office space that's currently under leased uh, by the federal government. Um, that does not include the campuses that they own. Um, I think it's unclear where the trends in telework and hybrid work will end up. Um, and we know that within the next six years, about half of this space will uh, be up for lease or you know will have to be renewed. And so there's a question about um, what the impacts will be. But again, this is much smaller than the, the number of federal leases in, in, the, in the district. Um, leases in the district, not including federal land, far exceed um, federal leases in, in the county. And so um, again, to the extent that we're a suburban county, there may be some opportunity um, for the, for, for the federal government here because you know many of the workers might actually live here, but you know that's sort of conjecture at the moment. Um, and you know the other sort of flip side is that newer buildings, trophy buildings, um, remain in demand. There's a s stark contrast in the rents and vacancy rates for buildings built before and after 2010. Um, we know that although office market uh, office demand is weakening, uh, what office tenants are looking for are you know higher tech buildings, buildings in in um, urban and amenitized locations that are convenient to get to. Um, to have you know collaborative spaces in there and, and sort of provide an alternative to the work environment at home. And you know just to sort of make this qualitative point that you know the office market is uh, an odyssey, not a jaunt. <laughs> um, you know uh, uh, estimates about how much the office market declined range from 25 percent to 80 percent. So if that should tell us anything, it's that it's hard to pin a number down about what the what the demand really is today. Um, some economists have suggested that some businesses may have shed too much space and may look to re-up. Um, their, their leases again going into the future. It's hard to say. And, and then some businesses may look to the suburbs to the extent that um, that's where people live and, and may want to work going forward. Um, and so just to summarize again, you know, office demand has declined throughout the region. We're no exception. Um, but as we mentioned, there are reasons to think that we may be inoculated from some of those impacts, just given the residential nature of our county, um, the relatively small portion of those federal leases, although again, very important. Um, and again, the vast majority of buildings are more than 50% occupied, so they may be generating some revenue, certainly less than before. Um, can those property owners continue to pay operating expenses and debt service? That's an open question, but um, to the extent that um, they're still mostly occupied, they may not necessarily be at that moment where they need um, intervention uh, yet. And so there's a little bit of a wait and see component to um, all of this as well. Um, I'm Bilal Ali with the Research and Strategic Projects Division at Montgomery Planning. Uh, here's my contact information. We have a blog out about uh, office vacancy as well. Um, so feel free to reach out if you have any other questions um, or comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. I thought that was a great presentation. And you did a great job too. Um, I had to say, uh, very straight to the point, and uh, I love that you mentioned the importance of the federal, federal government, uh, especially when it comes to leasing uh, properties here. And um, and the reality is that if we want to increase the job, the 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 tax base in Montgomery County, we need to build more jobs here so people can move here. That's just common sense. With that, we're gonna move on to our panel. If you can please uh, introduce yourself before you speak, you have about five minutes each. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the committee as always to please hold your questions until the very end. And, and I'm gonna and pass it to Ms. Marlene Yeah, Malcolm. I just wanna remind you, we have two online participants yes, we for do. this meeting, so. Do, uh, do, would, so they, we would it be okay if they speak at the end? Or do you tell them, is that fine? Okay, so after the last panelist in person, we'll go online, okay? Um, 
Would you like to start first? Thank you so much. I'm gonna turn that off there. Uh, good morning, Council. I'm Brad Wilner. I'm with uh, CBRE. Uh, it's the world's largest commercial real estate services firm. Was born and raised in Montgomery County. Still live here today. Um, I've spent my 18-year career working in Montgomery County and working on behalf of businesses and occupants or occupiers, as we call them. So our clients are basically the tenants that are leasing buildings within the county here. Was, uh, was thinking about preparing for this, and it dawned on me that in uh, later this month, we've got two longstanding Montgomery County businesses that will be signing leases to leave the county, uh, leaving behind about 60,000 square feet of vacancy for their headquarters, um, as well as hundreds of jobs. One of the, the, both of them will consider themselves technology and professional service businesses. One is going to Tyson's Corner because they wanted to be in more of a tech hub, as they called it. Their competitors are there. And so they felt it was important to be there. The other is going to downtown DC. Uh, they felt it was a more vibrant area for their employees, as well as for board members when they come in town, having a larger basis of uh, higher quality office space, as well as hotels, restaurants, things like that. So that's just two quick examples, but it dawned on me that very timely given this discussion here. So we think about real estate from a supply and demand perspective and Bilal, I think gave a good overview in terms of what we're seeing and as well as the challenges that we're faced with having higher supply and unfortunately limited demand right now. So the driver for that in many cases is the prevalence of hybrid work. So a lot of our clients in the businesses are giving more flexibility to their employees and their tenants to not necessarily have to come into the office. The resulting changes for the workplaces that they are based in um, in essence is, has shed space. And so you can create a, a collaborative environment for your employees, not necessarily, not necessarily allocating one office to one employee, but into some type of a shared environment, creating more meeting space and gathering spaces for those groups. So anecdotally, I would say we're seeing anywhere between 20 to 30% reduction in space needs for businesses. So as we think about the existing tenant base here in Montgomery County, it's a fair assumption to say that going forward over the next two to five years as those leases expire, many of those businesses will be shedding space. So from a demand perspective, we're gonna see that down. Um, our research department from CBRE has shown 32% uh, reduction in those that have moved over the last three years in terms of the amount of space that they're giving back. So unless there's outside tenants coming to the county, which, which have been few and far between, we know that the existing tenant base is not necessarily gonna support um, the county going forward with office space. On the supply side, we're, we're oversupplied and we've got too much obsolete office space. So our, our statistics, there's some nuances between CoStar and I think you're gonna hear from some other panelists here. We actually show the county over 20% vacancy, um, up from just under 14% first quarter of 2020. So a 50% increase in the amount of vacant office space that's come to bear. So um, in addition, you know, the one thing that isn't shown in these statistics, and it's been a bright spot for the county, is that some of these buildings being converted from office to life sciences. So if you take out those eight buildings and then another 13 buildings that have office space that are converting to life sciences, that'd be almost another 2% of vacancy if you factor that in. So that is one bright spot where we think about taking supply offline is taking some obsolete buildings and perhaps repurposing them. So something that we would encourage the council to think, think through and provide some upside. Um, by far, and there was a slide Bilal showed here, but flight to quality of all the relocations that we're doing with our clients right now, in many cases, they're upgrading the quality of building that they're going to. So of those five trophy, or I should state, Montgomery County has five trophy office buildings the way we track uh, that quality. I think you saw some examples of class A versus trophy. To give perspective, the district has 48 trophy buildings and 14.4 million square feet. We've got about 2 million square feet. Northern Virginia has about 16 trophy office buildings. That's really important when you think about regional site selection and having high quality opportunities out there. So there's a direct correlation between sort of the incentivization of developers and building new product to make sure that we've got high, pro high quality options that are out there. Um, so just to summarize, as I come up on five minutes here, um, really the lack of quality options we think is a big challenge for the, the county here. So if we're able to provide those type of buildings, we think that that's what would be attractive to the existing tenant base that's here. 
um, as well as incentivizing existing businesses that are here. I know there's been a priority for net new jobs previously, um, but would not forget the existing jobs and the existing businesses that are here to make sure that they're welcome and incentivized to stay here. Um, the adaptive reuse of buildings we think is really important as well. So taking this obsolete office product that in many cases um, no new tenants are going to be going to just because of the quality of building doesn't support their businesses and their employees is thinking about other uses for those. And while you're going to hear a little bit about life science conversions, I wouldn't discount what some of the other regions have done for multifamily redevelopment, medical office buildings, and so other ways of basically taking tired supply and converting it to more useful uses. And then the last thing I would say too, and you made a wonderful comment about the county being a great place to live, um, do not forget too, in many cases, site selection and locations are driven by where executives live. And so we have a very high income and uh, very wonderful county here that supports having people here. But when we start alienating those residences, in many cases, you might be alienating the businesses that those individuals might um, run as well. So just thinking about that correlation between the individuals that live here as well as the businesses that are here as well. Marriott is a great example. I think that's a great there example. You go. Absolutely. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, Thank you. Next. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ryan Metzroth. I'm the CEO of uh, Wilco Companies. We're a locally owned uh, commercial landlord and developer um, with a substantial portion of our portfolio in Montgomery County. And as it relates to the topic at hand today, um, just so you all have a perspective of where I'm coming from, the, the vast majority of our commercial office assets in the county are um, classified as Class B in most instances. Um, so, you know, given that we're long-term holders and we, um, you know, have ownership track records dating back 50 years in some cases, um, might be coming from a slightly different perspective than others. Uh, when it comes to uh, recent trends that we've seen in the commercial office market, um, to state the obvious, leasing activity in our Class B and even some of the Class A assets um, has dropped substantially. Um, we used to get, you know, calls or, or physical tours from prospective tenants and businesses multiple times a week, um, and now it's maybe two or three times a month. So, uh, as a result of that, you know, as as imperative as attracting new businesses and new tenants to the county is, um, our focus has sort of been forced to uh, reside more in taking actionable steps to retain the existing businesses and the existing tenants we have. Um, albeit you know, still very necessary that the part of a, an office building's long-term health um, needs to attract new tenants. Uh, as it relates to shifts in the market as a result of uh, the pandemic, um, as, as Brad mentioned, uh, shrinking footprints of tenants is a, is a really big one. Um, you know, speaking firsthand, we've had multiple tenants over the last 36 months um, I think Brad said 20 to 30 percent of reduction. We're we're looking more at 30 to 40 percent. Um, so you know we're we're again we're working with the tenants, but that's still sort of where it's rubbing out. Uh, the other the other big variable we're looking at is the consolidation of space. So for tenants that we have that might have multiple locations, multiple physical offices, they're making the very intentional choice to consolidate into one of those locations. So, um, you know, again, firsthand, we, we have tenants ranging from 5,000 square feet and 30,000 square feet that within the next 18 to 24 months will be consolidating to a single uh, location. So the, the vacancy from that perspective might increase as well. Uh, and then there's the, you know, the ever evolving hybrid work model. Um, we tend to think that it's trending in the right direction. People are coming back to the office, uh, but but hybrid working isn't going anywhere. It is here to stay, um, and you know any anything we can do to try to incentivize the tenants to come back usually results in us having to spend more money to create a a uh, physical office that is attracting them to come back. You know, it's it's hard to beat somebody's living room <laughs> and their couch. You know, especially if they have. A family running around too so um, 
when discussing the possibility of, of you know, office to residential conversions or office to life science conversions, uh, they always sound like a great idea. And candidly, that's because they are. Um, but just because they are a great idea doesn't mean they're necessarily financially or physically possible. Uh, if there was some sort of incentivized funding program um, like other municipalities have created, it would be a much more uh, palatable event to tackle to mitigate any sort of the inherent risk that comes with that. Um, we are doing a, Wilco is doing a conversion uh, downtown from the former Peace Corps headquarters. Uh, we're converting the former office building to 163 apartments with um, about 8,000 square feet of retail on the bottom. But quite frankly, the reason we could do that is because we've owned it since the 60s and we had no debt. So we, were, we had the capacity to take on that additional debt. Um, the vast majority of the office buildings in the county have existing debt on it. So before you even sort of get started into it, more often than not, those conversion projects uh, have a hard time penciling out. Um, as far as actionable steps that uh, the public sector could take to address these office vacancies, it's, it, it's a really big question. Um, commercial building owners can't directly create jobs. The county can't directly create jobs. The biggest thing that can create jobs is attracting the right kind of businesses. And typically those are, are businesses that fall within the innovation sector. And as that relates to the county, we're talking life science. Um, there's, a, there's a massive domino effect when you create the right, or create an environment where the right kind of tenants, high skilled tenants, uh, cluster together. Then there's a, you know, there's a multiplier effect with all the other less skilled jobs and less skilled employers um, that come along for the ride. So really to me it's about creating job opportunities um, and creating enough incentive for those high-end businesses and creative businesses to come to the county. Um, you know, things like the MOVE program, the existing MOVE program, it's great in theory, um, but it's far from as robust as it needs to be. Uh, it does, you know, it directly helps the tenants, but from the landlord's perspective, it's, it's essentially just a drop in the bucket. Um, we're still facing the same issues of funding and you know having to build out space for tenants that quite frankly are are demanding it so unless we can create some sort of incentivized program that's a little more with a little more depth to it um, the existing landlords uh, are stuck sort of playing musical chairs with the existing tenant base um, which is you know anything but sustainable Thanks. thank you very much for that um Report. It was right straight on the target, in my view. Uh, next. Hi, my name is Mark Rittenberg. I'm a founder of AMR Commercial. We're a Bethesda-based commercial brokerage uh, since 1994. I'm a lifelong county resident. Um, and obviously, having listened to this, and if you've watched the news, you know that the office market is having some problems. So my uh, testimony is a little bit repetitive, but... Obviously, in the wake of um, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, we experienced a shift to remote work and a very slow return to the office. Uh, as a result, the demand for office space has plummeted. Office utilization is hovering around 50%. And I know we've talked a lot about vacancy rates, utilization rates, you know, Marriott delivered, great, it's 100% occupied. Uh, but really, it's about 25 to 30 percent utilization. And so um, a lot of office buildings that show up in Bilal's report as, uh, as leased, as low vacancy, really is covering um, a wave that's coming. Um, like these gentlemen discussed, you know, tenants shrinking, not renewing, and moving. And, and nobody really knows what that number is, but it's, it's coming. Um, and it's not the first time that the county has seen the supply outstrip demand, but what is unprecedented is the speed at which it happened and that it's happening in a time of low unemployment and high interest rates. Um, and obviously a lot of people argue that um, the answer to many problems is conversion to residential. 
Um, I've sold several office buildings um, since the pandemic, including one that was on Bilal's report, 1110 Bonifant, has that nice picture right next to the Sarbanes um, Transportation Center. I couldn't find a developer who wanted to convert that building. Unobstructed views on three sides, literally at multiple forms of public transportation. The cost is so exorbitant and the effort so great and the market just isn't there in many places. And so the private sector is just unable to do it. Um, and so it's just a problem that can't be solved just in the private sector. The government obviously is going to have to respond. Um, what I did was I spoke to several of my landlord clients and tenant clients to get sort of a consensus on some action items that might actually be possible without taking on big, hairy um, programs to help solve this problem. And a couple of items that we came up with, um, this was brought up every time, building owner and building occupant, streamlining the permit process for office build outs, allowing those trying to expand or move to the county, uh, the ability to do so without the multitude of delays that the county is well known for, um, attracting a younger workforce by encouraging the nighttime economy to grow, um, a critical mass of young workers brings the employers, not the other way around, um, looking at ways to make commutes faster, I know that's a big item but one of the things that was brought up to me several times was as more people once again begin commuting to the cbds things that make commutes more difficult like bike lanes must be re-examined i know that's controversial but um, some people feel as though we're choking off access to the engines the economic engines of our county uh, and then the last thing which this is a little bit of a bigger item is um, a fund that loans or grants money to building owners whose biggest hurdle to expanding or adding tenants may be the huge cost of construction in today's market. Rental rates haven't moved in many, many years. Construction costs, as everybody knows, have skyrocketed. And so oftentimes an owner who has a tenant that wants to expand or they want to bring a tenant from a building across the river or from the district, um, the cost to build them the space they need is just um, undoable and so if there were a way for owners to access a fund somehow to help with that um, we think that might possibly help bring new jobs and, and expansion to the county thank you very much thank you so much you touched on so many key points including when you mentioned the nightlife economy let's not forget <clears throat> public safety yep. you know businesses need to feel safe customers and clients need to feel safe to go and shop and go to the office any time of the day so that's that's also a, a very key uh, point which reminds me I have a town hall in Wheaton on public safety tomorrow at 6 30 p.m. Wheaton library everyone um, and that has a direct impact impact with our business community um, next Good morning, Morgan Sullivan with JLL. We're a publicly traded real estate services firm. Uh, we are a bit um, contradictory as we just renewed our lease at Pike and Rose for our full footprint of space that we had pre-pandemic. Uh, we do wish that there were more to Brad and Ryan and Mark's observations. We do wish there were more. Uh, tenants that were doing that um, in Pike and Rose and elsewhere throughout the county. Uh, I've been a, a, a practitioner at JLL for 30 years. I'm a resident of Montgomery County and my book of business is primarily centered in Montgomery County. And Madam President, I would echo a statement that you made a moment ago. We are very fortunate, extraordinarily fortunate here in Montgomery County to have all the qualities that we enjoy as our citizens. We have um, a number of academic institutions. We have a large um, and robust cultural and entertainment segment. Our climate is, fa is viewed as favorable. We're proximate to our nation's capital. We're the headquarters of more than a dozen federal agencies. Each and every one of those qualities, every jurisdiction competing with us uh, locally, regionally, and nationally would give their 
<clears throat> would give anything to have any of the you know a number of those qualities and we have all of those accumulated here yet <clears throat> it, since 2017 to 2022 a period of five years we lost 17,000 jobs which is 3.1 percent of our total workforce the national growth during those five years growth was 3.8 percent so that actually puts us at 6.9% behind the national average, notwithstanding all of those high quality uh, characteristics that we enjoy as a citizens and, and professional practitioners here in Montgomery County. When I look at the county, I see a number of stumbling blocks and choke points, uh, a number of which have been introduced by my fellow panelists, but allow me to uh, walk through these permitting challenges local income tax, minimum floating minimum wage. We are not a right to work state, which we know you don't control, but that's very impactful when companies are doing a regional or national search. We have an energy tax, we have rent control, and we have recently increased recreation, real estate and impact taxes. None of those are exclusive to Montgomery County. All of those in aggregate are exclusive to Montgomery County, and they put forth a message that we are not pro-business. Additionally, economic incentives are a very important part of retention <clears throat> and, re and recruitment of companies, but they are not the determining factor. There has never been a company that made a decision to stay or move because of the amount of incentives they got. I view it as the cherry on top of the icing on top of the cake. And the cake and the icing are the ability to attract and retain employees. That's why companies move here. That's why companies stay here. <clears throat> Additionally, and the panelists touched on, uh, my fellow panelists touched on this, um, we in the county have been hit high and low, much like every other jurisdiction nationally by the <clears throat> double impact of the return to work which was spurred by the pandemic and also the dramatic increase in interest rates. So to Mark's point, yes, we track vacancy, but it's impossible to track the true measure of the health or unhealthiness of our office market, which is occupancy. And I do think, and it was in the presentation, that in this next six years, there is going to be a very severe reckoning as these buildings, as these tenants start to address their lease expirations rolling and they don't need all the space that they've committed to and, and that they've continued to service. And when I look at <clears throat> specific addresses and specific buildings that many of us are familiar with, we could, we could go on the rooftop of this building and look down on four buildings right here in the center of the city of Rockville that are <clears throat> that are distressed 255 rockville pike 21 church street 600 jefferson plaza 51 monroe street those are very symbolic buildings of 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 what the uh distress that this county and our state and our country are going to be facing uh, back to economic incentives they are a very important component of attraction and retention but they are a component they're not the answer Thank you very much. Thank you for that depressing <laughs> overview. You're right on target, but it's it's this is why we're having this session today, also ahead of the next budget. Um, we need to be radical in terms of what we're doing as a county to attract uh, the innovation sector, spe especially the innovation sector, to move here. Um, next. Good morning. Thank you, council members and council chair, for having us here today. Appreciate that. My name is Pete Briskman, and I also work for JLL. And I'll be brief because Morgan touched on a lot of points. Uh, however, I, I see things um, from a different perspective than a lot of these panelists because I focus a big part of my practice on national site selection in comparison to local site selection and whereas a lot of my business is local we also compare national jurisdictions against montgomery county and so a lot of the things that our clients look at are not necessarily base rent or vacancy it deals with labor taxes availability yes affordability does matter and morgan touched on rent control job growth 
and training. And this is all really factored in and, and pulled together when determining where to relocate to. Some relevant data points here locally, uh, leasing volume pre-pandemic was about 9.5 million square feet, post-pandemic 7 million square feet. That's a reduction of about 36% of that, and, and this team of panelists did a great job of breaking it down. 60% of that activity for leasing is Class A, Class B is about 30%, and Class C is about 5%. And so what does that mean? Uh, there's definitely deal volume and flight to quality, um, but it's not keeping pace with companies downsizing, going hybrid or fully remote. So the vacancy rates in Class A, which we see somewhat as our trend and a little bit of a savior, it's actually a little bit misleading because it's actually rising despite having the majority of lease volume. Some other data points. Um, new development in the last 10 years, and we'll, we'll just, we'll pick on the I-270 corridor here versus the toll road in Northern Virginia. Five, 517,000 square feet of new development on the I-270 corridor versus the toll road of 2.3 million over the last 10 years. So we, we should figure out why. I think we, you know, as subject matter experts, we all have a pretty good understanding, but maybe uh, dig a little deeper into that. And then just related to um, how national companies view different jurisdictions and compare them, and keep in mind that we, we've worked with Marriott, Total Wine, Novavax, and helping them negotiate their incentives. Um, it, it, it really does matter, rent control, because they care about the affordability of where their employees live, and they want to make sure that there are measures in place. And the, the way they'll look at rent control and the way we look at rent control is not just that it's, it's, it's capped at 6% with inflation, it's also about the potential future availability because developers won't want to build with those caps. So it, it is a little bit of a red flag. Um, the, the job growth, that's gonna be, uh, it's a double-edged sword because Talent is actually one of the biggest items that these companies look for when ranking different jurisdictions. And there's no question we have this highly skilled workforce, which is phenomenal. We're, you know, we have high concentration of PhDs. But uh, from what I hear on a daily basis is that we really need to step up our game in training and training for specific job types that maybe aren't PhDs. My, my focus is on life sciences. I, I um, lead Mid-Atlantic Life Sciences practice for JLL. Prior to that, I led uh, office brokerage uh, for Maryland. It went, and uh, I can tell you that labor and training in life sciences is the number one issue when we go out and search. And that, uh, then the trickle-down issues, again, uh, related to that will be um, wage, wages and, and uh, payroll taxes and tax burdens uh, when you compare different jurisdictions. So in summary, what we see on a national basis and comparing it locally to Montgomery County is we need to streamline the permitting process, reduce the tax burden and have more of a business mindset, step up our game in training and growing our talent base. Not only, not only uh, the, the talent we have here today, um, but the younger folks in starting a grade school with different trades. Um, and the, the energy tax is, is, again, a double-edged sword because there's this tax, but together we can market the fact that uh, the, the tax does go towards uh, potential benefits of new buildings. And so that's something that we should all collaborate and consider in our marketing efforts. Uh, Public-private partnerships, uh, the folks that we work with, we are, the feedback that we get is that they want to have a larger say and they want to partner um, with public entities. And then in, you know, in conclusion and filling these office vacancies, it, it really is, and we've heard it today from our esteemed panelists, that it is a multifaceted approach. We need to develop these partnerships, public, private, implement targeted policies and targeted incentives. For example, um, life sciences, the MJM, more jobs for Marylanders, that played really, really well. 
and a lot of our clients wanted that to sunset um, and it's geared toward manufacturing which is something that we want to grow and compare to the other clusters so if, it, if it's life sciences that would be an example but in attracting other industries I think we should be very targeted in what these companies look for and what they need and that's it thank you very much thank you and you touched Pete right yeah. uh, you touched on a couple very strong points on the training um, views that you have and and really focus on the manufacturing it's so important and I love that you also talked about the 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 importance of making sure that our kids or children are ready to take on these jobs. The very first session we have in this committee back in June, back in January, was me being very upset with MCPS and how possibly is the fact that third graders in this uh, county are so far behind on math and reading in terms of performance. Uh, in our last budget, we really made a focus on ensuring that MCPS and the Montgomery County uh, public school system will have um, more funds to support our young folks because they're the future and, and you touched on that, so I appreciate you for that. We're gonna move to our virtual speakers. We're gonna start with Mr. Oliver Carr. You are on, sir. Good morning, uh, council members. My apologies for not being there in person. Had some flight challenges uh, trying to get back yesterday evening. Um, and uh, I'll try not to be too depressing. Uh, it's a tough, tough subject these days. Um, so I'm Oliver Carr, CEO of Carr Properties, and we are a institutionally held real estate investment trust focused on uh, investing and owning and developing commercial office. And we have holdings in the DC area, including um, in Bethesda, we recently developed the Wilson and the Elm, which is a million foot project in downtown Bethesda. Uh, we also built and own 4500 East West Highway. Um, that building we constructed in 2014. But we've got a unique perspective because we're also active in the Boston, Massachusetts market, as well as in Austin, Texas. And we expanded into those markets um, because they are, you know, innovation-based economies seeing a lot of, a lot of growth. Um, so the office market today is in really tough shape. It's actually the most challenging I've seen in my 30-year career. We're facing a demand problem because extended pandemic-related business shutdowns accelerated the trend to remote and hybrid work, reducing demand for office space. At the same time, the industry is facing a credit and valuation crisis due to the rapid increase in interest rates, and we're in a restrictive credit environment. These two big trends have led to a 40 to 50% decline in office values. Vacancy rates are at all time highs, and in the suburban Maryland markets, if you include direct vacancy and sublet space, the vacancy rate is over 22%. We're also facing low utilization of space, which you've heard about today. So that, that measures you know, people coming in to work today versus what they did pre-pandemic. And our utilization rate today is about 45% of pre-pandemic levels, and that's nationally. In the DC metro area, leasing volumes are off by 40% from pre-pandemic levels. And all of these negative pressures, but most importantly, the decline in office building values is leading to significant loan defaults. It's estimated that 50% of office buildings in the greater DC area now have a value below their current debt amounts. So that's, that's a really troubling statistic. Um, sales volumes for commercial office are off by almost 80% year over year. Um, and when you look at the decline in values combined with reduced transaction activity, you know, that'll have a severe negative impact on tax receipts coming out of the, out of the office sector. The one bright spot we've seen is that um, there has been a flight to quality. And our, our company generally focuses on 
you know, premier, you know, quality office space. But the best quality buildings frequently described as trophy office are outperforming the rest of the market by a wide margin. So looking at downtown DC, for example, the vacancy rate for the trophy segment of the market is currently at about 12 and a half percent versus an overall vacancy rate for the market of 18%. So the best quality newest buildings are definitely outperforming. Um, so, you know, are these trends going to continue into the future? Um, you know, my opinion is that the weakness in office demand as a result of remote work is going to persist for a few more years. So what's happening today is companies are working through the process of right-sizing their office space to adapt to their new way of working. And this has resulted on average to about a 20% reduction in the amount of space companies lease. So when a company's lease comes up for renewal, generally they're reducing their space again by about 20%. I think this, this trend will eventually stop, but that's not going to happen until most companies have right have right sized and we're not quite there yet. So I my view is this will continue for another, you know, two to three years. So in, in summary, it's a really challenging market. And when I think about, you know, how the county should respond and what the county can do to help heal this market, I think in the near term, and I mean, you know, kind of immediately, the county should consider offering property tax incentives to encourage the repurposing of obsolete office buildings into residential use. You've heard today about how challenging it is to convert an existing building into residential, and I, I agree with that. So we use the term repurposing because frequently the best course is to tear down the existing office building and build new purpose-built residential. DC actually just you know, put together a pretty good model for how to do this. They're offering a 20 year tax abatement um, to repurpose obsolete office into residential. And in exchange, they're, um, you know, meeting some of their affordable housing goals. So we, we like what the district has done um, on, this, on this strategy. I would also suggest that the county, you know, play to its strengths as a life science and hospitality industry hub. You know, for example, the county could consider offering tax incentives to attract, you know, life science companies to move into urban nodes like Bethesda. So think about the areas like Bethesda that offer the amenities and quality of life features where people, people want to work and they want to live. So bringing life science into urban markets and attracting more hospitality oriented companies will heal downtown markets you know, like Bethesda, which are really suffering today. Um, so then lastly, I, I think just in terms of the mindset, you know, of Montgomery County, um, it needs to be seen as a, as a business friendly county um, that's working hard to attract new companies and grow the job base. The county's done a, a terrific job with the life science sector. However, my sense is there has not been a robust effort to attract technology or professional services companies into the county. There's really gotta be a long-term commitment to this effort, and it should be done with the public sector working closely with the private sector. You need to give companies a reason to choose Montgomery County over our low cost you know, neighboring counties in Virginia. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Carr, and I think I truly appreciate your remarks, and you were absolutely correct when you're talking about um, especially changing the culture in Montgomery County, especially among government uh, workers. We need to have a yes culture, especially if you're, if you're working in DPS, HHAs, one, one of, of the many agencies where you're dealing directly with potential um, you know, companies moving in, if there's an obstacle, it's not you telling them you cannot do this. It's telling them, let's figure this out and how can we make this happening. So um, that's key. Uh, we're going to go to our next panelist who's also virtual, Mr. Rocky Fried. Is he on? Yeah. There you go. Hi, 
Yeah, Rocky Freed. Oh, uh, good morning. Go. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present today. I'll, I'll try not to be too repetitive. Uh, I am a partner in the head of real estate at Fairlawn Capital Management. Uh, we're based in San Francisco, California, so I'm pretty far away. That's my excuse. Uh, I'm probably the least qualified person related to Montgomery County uh, experience at this meeting, but I'll do my best to provide um, insights we've gained from our national real estate portfolio. As others have said, I think that work from home is a permanent condition. Uh, employees want more balance in their lives. And despite recent return to office mandates from the likes of Amazon and Facebook, this, ten, this trend will never be fully reversed. Um, many market pundits have indicated there will be a 25% plus reduction in office utilization. I think that's on the low end. Uh, many lower end office jobs, such as call centers, have proven to be effective. Uh, working from home, affording uh, employees a higher quality lifestyle, and saving employers significant um, expenditures on office rent. I'm not saying that office is dead. I'm just saying that the demand is permanently diminished. Uh, long commutes are a thing of the past. Office will have a role for many companies, but it's going to be more related to training, community, and higher end strategic collaborations. Uh, suburban locations will uh, definitely benefit from the uh, work-life balance. What office and office buildings are going to win in this new era, uh, well-located, highly amenitized town centers are the winners. They've uh, held on to their occupancy the best throughout the pandemic. Occupancies in these mixed-use projects are trending in the right way uh, post-COVID. Employees want to live and work and play close to home. You know, they want to go home and see their dog. Um, <clears throat> experiential retail and convenience are key. Large floor plate B office buildings are in secondary locations. Uh, with large parking fields and no on-site food and beverage are the clear losers in this new world order. Uh, tenants want modern, collaborative, flexible, well-located space. Incumbent landlords historically have had large retention advantages, but this has gone away as downsizing and rethinking of office needs often make uh, tenants uh, relocating a, a better option. Alternative uses is something you uh, everyone's talked about today. I don't think that this is the panacea for everything. We have been episodic life science investors, including in Montgomery County, and believe in the long-term value proposition of the space. However, there is at present a dearth of capital for these nascent companies, which will, which will spill over into weak real estate demand. Furthermore, significant supply has come online and is continuing to come online in the life science sector. The next few years in life science will be bumpy and the cost to retrofit historical office buildings into life science buildings are non-economic in the current environment. Montgomery County is better positioned than most to capture any viable, any viable conversions, however. My suggestions are to cut red tape, look at employer retention and, and attraction benefits, to make sure your cost structures are in line with surrounding counties. Ultimately, location matters, but people will travel a bit for ease of completion and cost benefits. Lastly, regarding office to residential conversions. This is not a solution. Very few office buildings have the right depths for these transformations to be cost effective. In suburban areas, the more likely outcome is demolition followed by mixed use ground up construction, providing appropriate zoning, speed to market, thoughtful planning, low impact fees and taxes while creating live, work and play, uh, not always necessarily at huge densities is the way to repurpose obsolete suburban office locations to rebuild tax base and attract and retain jobs. Not every site is gonna be a 10 on a 10 on a walk score, but creating mini villages is what employers and employees want, making it affordable, time efficient and accessible is a great role for government. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate your remarks. Um, before I turn it to my colleagues, I'm gonna go uh, by the order that I have received requests. We're gonna start with uh, Council Member Lorian Sells. First question, then Council President Evan Glass. And I'm making the assumption, Ma'am Malcolm will also have a few questions. Um, but before they start, I would just say that we're gonna take every comment that has been said and the ones that are gonna come soon. And I'm gonna work with the, it's great that we have the small business center and representatives here. I see the county executives um, reps here in the back and I see uh, the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation is also here. Uh, we're gonna follow up, uh, put a, a work project together with ideas based on the discussion that we just had and the one that we're about to have and then come back to the committee and see how we can move forward because the last thing I need or one is to just have a briefing about this uh, how bad the, the office market is 
and not do anything, uh, that will be a waste of time. You're always, you know, wasting your time and my time. So we're gonna come up with a plan and we're gonna uh, send it around for people to, to review. Okay, so first question, Council Member Lorian Sells. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I also wanted to acknowledge the uh, planning department that's here. I know that permitting was mentioned quite a few times about streamlining, so I'm glad that we have all the stakeholders here. And just want to thank everyone for the briefing, the data, and also from our business community. We're always hoping to hear feedback and recommendations on how we can do things better, but given the market constraints and the environment that we are in, those um, we're going to have to be innovative in how we are attracting this new um, business sector. Um, you know, the city of Gaithersburg is the biotech corridor of the region, and we're hoping that we can continue to grow from that region and some of the uh, best practices that they've used to attract and retain and grow uh, that corridor across the region. Um, this has been really helpful to um, think about how we're going to repurpose uh, some of these buildings and you know even thinking about the um, the economic constraints for the conversions are just another barrier to how we're going to repurpose um, these um, uh, vacant buildings um, and I know we mentioned what's happening in Virginia but I'm wondering if we've looked at any other neighboring jurisdictions. Um, I know the uh, Frederick is growing their biotech region. I know, um, I'm not sure about Prince George's County and how they're doing with their um, office space as well. So I don't know if there's any um, information you can provide there. Um, you know, I know that there are some policy uh, changes and um, incentive packages that you've mentioned. So I'm looking forward to hearing from our Economic Development Corporation to uh, further discuss how we can address these challenges. Um, but um, are there any opportunities for um, us to think about co-working spaces? You know, a lot of the small businesses um, are looking for spaces and we have these big buildings corporations and I know that um, even during the pandemic we had conversions happening where people were retrofitting their buildings to accommodate smaller businesses we know that there is a need for um, opportunities for collaboration so even if we're unable to do the uh, full conversion to residential have we looked at what that would cost to um, accommodate smaller workspaces? Um, have we talked about lowering the um, rent for um, tenants? Any incentive packages that you've offered tenants to bring them back into the office? And I believe it was on The Economist or NPR this morning about the new environment that um, corporations are having to create to bring people back into the office space and so just wanted to see if you can talk more specifically about those thank you well Lorianne with regard to um, the incentive packages that are being offered to tenants to lure them back um, it's a battle between building owners to see who, you know it's an arms race to see who can provide the most um, free rent reduced rent um, construction money is a big thing because um, tenants coming back to the office want um, it built new to bring their employees back and so a lot of times it's the owner that wakes up that morning the hungriest that wins the deal because they're offering the most concessions and um, that's why i discussed during my testimony about the possibility of um, funds available for owners um, to perform construction because there's a huge amount of money going into these deals just to get a tenant to come to your building um, and they're competing regionally so they're competing with buildings oftentimes in northern Virginia and in Prince George's County and in Frederick County and the cost to uh, build um, shared office space um, you know we look at a company like WeWork who um, is 
is failing miserably, their model is um, to do exactly that, build big, beautiful, amenitized spaces, um, but that comes with a cost. And many smaller tenants um, would love to be there and sit in that town hall room and drink their free coffee, but uh, at the end of the day, um, it's easier for them to stay in their basement. I see Mr. Carr has his hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to respond quickly um, to the question. So a couple things. I think um, when you look around the region for the best model so far on repurposing office to residential, as I mentioned in my remarks, I would I would look at DC. Um, and what, what DC is doing is they're offering a 20 year tax abatement for the conversion of obsolete office into residential. And in exchange for that, they're requiring 10, you know, it's a choice, either 10% of the um, units have to be affordable at 60% of MFI or 18% of the units have to be made available at 80% of MFI. Um, and without incentives like that, the economics to, you know, convert an existing failed office building into residential really don't work. So this is not a, um, you know, economic benefit for developers. It's actually what's needed to get anything done. Um, and I concur with the comments around co-working. I think um, the business has a lot of potential but its current structure really doesn't work. Um, so the co-working companies sign long-term leases and then they turn around and rent their space on a short-term basis and that, that model doesn't work. So I think we're likely to see WeWork go out of, you know, go into bankruptcy or otherwise, you know, very, very soon. And they're the biggest player in that space. And then the last point about amenities, um, you know, the best buildings are winning. There's no question about that. So, um, you know, we're, we're very proud of um, our Wilson office building we built at 7272 Wisconsin. So we delivered during, you know, during the pandemic in 2021, and we were 100% leased. And, you know, the reason for that is that, um, you know, we offer our customers a really unique experience with amazing amenities, great rooftop, um, great retail on the ground floor. So I think that's that's the future of office. You've got to create really unique projects with, you know, a great quality of life and they'll be successful. But it's really hard to take an older building and do that. So I think um, you're going to see the market split where the best buildings do just fine and older buildings are likely going to fail and unfortunately go back to the bank mm. and will have to be converted to something else. Um, but that's that's the market today. Thank you so much for that. I yield. Thank you. And I'm just going to remind folks that we have a second panel after this. Uh, Council, member, Council President Evan Glass. Uh, well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you all for the presentation. Uh, and Mr. Ali and Ms. Michelson, thank you for the packet. So a lot to unpack here, and I appreciate the, um, the brain trust that you've assembled, people who do this day in and day out and have been doing it for decades. So thank you for sharing your perspectives. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll start with my thoughts on the, the federal workforce, which we've talked about, various, um, uh, various presentations and comments. Uh, and what I, I've just seen um, is that about one third of federal employees are going back into the office, depending on agencies and departments. Uh, and Montgomery County was one of the 23 regional jurisdictions that signed a letter uh, to President Biden encouraging more back to office uh, engagement. Uh, and so we know that that not only will help the market, but it will help with the street life and the nightlife and the public safety and our metro system and public transit, all of which uh, feeds into a, a good business environment, as you've all articulated, right? There's a, a holistic approach. Uh, the concern that you've raised and uh, 
that now has me concerned is that utilization rate, which is clearly the, the canary in the coal mine. Not much has been spoken of it. We're just looking at the vacancy rate. Um, so thank you for elevating that, something that we'll continue looking at, although the, the, the long-term uh, readout is, is not favorable. Uh, we at least know what the target is, and we need to keep our mind on that. Uh, yeah, and, and I was intrigued also with the conversation about uh, trophy and Class A, um, but Mr. Metzroth, uh, as a, a proprietor within a lot of Class B space here, and if I did my math on the, on the pie chart correctly, about 40% of the office space here in Montgomery County is Class B. Could you share with us who are your tenants, right? If 40% of Montgomery County office space is Class B, there's a demand for it. Um, and we, we know the Fortune 500 companies that want to come here, want to either build their own space or rent a lot of trophy or Class A space. Um, but there's a story to be told about the Class B space, too. Can you tell their story? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> by far, our biggest tenant in Montgomery County um, actually is NIH. Um, we, we own a building that's uh, 250,000 square feet on Executive Boulevard. Could you lean in a little bit further? Um, we, we own a building uh, that's about 250,000 square feet on Executive Boulevard, backs up right next to Pike and Rose. Uh, for the past, call it 20 years, NIH had a full uh, building lease on that building. About two years ago, they reduced their footprint to half. So that is still very much our, our biggest tenant. Other than that, it's, it's local businesses that candidly either need to do business in Montgomery County because they're attached to government contracts or they're you know, mom and pop startups that have had success and expanded and you know, we rely on our, our personal relationships with those tenants to work with them to ensure that they do have what they need. Um, and you know, it fits the, the economic puzzle for both of us, so it's it's a spectrum. Well, well, thank you for sharing that. It's it's what I assumed it was, right? It's our solid middle class entrepreneurs, um, probably some lawyers and some doctors uh, and accountants and others who are making a living in the community where they're raising their family. That's right. And where they've chosen to be, um, and so we need to clearly have a conversation about how to encourage. Uh, more and retain more, uh, but we can't lose sight of the homegrown businesses and what their 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 needs might be. Mr. Sullivan, I saw you raise your hand. Uh, I did. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make the point that Montgomery County's tenant base is, uh, resembles what your financial advisor would advise you to have as your own personal uh, investments, which is diversification. So we have life science, which we could say is fast growth. Uh, we have bonds, which would be our federal agencies that occupy space here in the county. We have Fortune 200 companies in the form of Lockheed Martin and Marriott, whose global headquarters are here. And then I think the most dynamic is what Ryan just walked you through, which is local services companies that are organic to our county. So, so uh, we're not heavily weighted to say defense like sub, like uh, Northern Virginia or technology like San Francisco. So we do we we benefit greatly from our diversification of tenants, which has helped us insulate from being in an, in an even worse position than we would be otherwise. Thank thank you for elevating that. Uh, you know another issue that that has been raised, I think, by by everybody is permitting and the processes to build and to, to operate. And it is one of the main reasons why at the start of this council, I really wanted there to be a standalone economic development committee with which, within which MCEDC would be, but also the Department of Permitting Services, recognizing the relationship between DPS and economic development. And there is actually a work group underway right now. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. The work group with, uh, with the planning department, I, I am looking at Mr. The, the chair, Mr. Harris, um, and leaders from the uh, executive agencies. And I will be very candid in saying uh, 
there were a lot of questions and concerns about the start of this work group and about power grabbing. And in my opinion, we needed a work group to work through these issues. Otherwise, without dialogue and without sitting around a table, uh, none of these issues are going to be addressed. And by what I'm hearing from the executive side and from folks in planning, um, those conversations are being fruitful. Uh, and so I am hopeful at the conclusion of this work group uh, in the coming months, there will be tangible steps uh, to cut some red tape, to streamline processes. Uh, and so I am optimistic. I'm looking again at Mr. Chair um, to, to, to see a good landing of this plane uh, because I am, I am hopeful. Again, uh, we know we need to do better and having everybody around the table whose goal it is to do better is, is the first step. Um, the last question I have, and this is a real question, uh, conversions versus repurposing, right? Um, so I, I picked up on, on, on the vernacular there. The proposal that's in DC, the 20 year abatement, um, it's not unprecedented here. Uh, I co-sponsored a bill in the last council uh, to uh, have a similar style abatement for residential construction that is built on metro stations, recognizing that we need more residential at metro stations. And there, were cons there was concern among people in the community and the county executive um, that abatements weren't needed uh, because it's valuable property and so it would be built. And my reply was, well, if it's so valuable and so easy to build, build, why hasn't it been done? Uh, and so I was proud to support that effort. Uh, clearly, uh, we know that our budget is in a little different situation. Uh, you all saw what happened this year. You've referenced it. I can't predict what's going to happen next year. Uh, but as your building and property tax assessments start coming in, um, we'll have that conversation next year and we'll see what we can do because I'm a firm believer in that if we want more housing that is affordable, we need more housing. Uh, and so uh, I will do everything I can to try and be creative, uh, find models that work within our system, within our county and within our budget. But I look forward to those conversations. And the last, last thing I just want to say is a comment. Um, it's also been referenced uh, the quality of life here and the business environment here. And not everything that has been referenced is within the jurisdiction of the Montgomery County Council. We are one county. In 20, within a state that has 24 different jurisdictions, but we have a general assembly and a governor, um, and there are things that have been referenced that come from high on and come down to us as well. But it is my hope that as you all continue talking with businesses around the country and sharing the virtue of the DC region, there are differences. I know that. There are differences in taxes and there are differences uh, in other types of regulation um, and fees. But Montgomery County is home to the most diverse communities in the country. We have among the best schools. We have among the highest paying jobs. We have some of the best health care outcomes. And yes, we support labor and we support our working families. And I know it's a, a balancing act, but I find those to be virtues and reasons for people to want to come here and raise their families. Uh, and I know it's part of an ongoing conversation, but I think there are good things about what we have here and what we're trying to do. And we always have to be in conversation, but there are good things here in Montgomery County. And I look forward to continuing to talk and have conversations with you about that in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Council Member Mer uh, Marilyn Malkin. Um, thank you. Uh, th there is a lot to unpack here. And thank you all for coming. And thank you for being here. Uh, so I do just want to piggyback a little bit on what uh, President Glass said. Um, yes, of course, we know that there are really great things in Montgomery County. And uh, that's why we're all here. That's why uh, you all have made your homes here for lifetimes for many of you. Um, I think what's important is 
Um, we've heard many of these things before in terms of uh, business climate, red tape, certainly streamlining permitting. And I think that um, your jobs are to sell the county, and, and I'm sure you do that very, very well. But our jobs, our job is to listen to you, right? So we've asked this panel, th these panelists to come here, and they've shared with us why they, uh, they, they hit obstacles. So our job now is to listen and take that to heart. And I think that business climate is one of those um, vague, vague issues that the business community has been talking about for years, for years. And it's harder to solve than incentives or tax abatements or looking at quality buildings, trophy buildings. But as a committee, I think that that's what we need to do. And I, and I appreciate what the chair said at the very beginning that we can't have this panel and then uh, tick the box and go away. So I look forward to, uh, and I know that uh, the four of us will work together to, uh, to come up with some, some concrete plans, I hope. Um, so some of the issues that I wanted to just briefly talk about, I know we're, we're crunched for time. Um, so I think that the, uh, you know, the issue of conversions is um, very interesting from the perspective of our zoning. And so, and I know that, um, uh, you know, with Thrive 2050, there's been a little bit of a shift, but, but very often we have this balance of uh, commercial, residential, retail to make a whole community. And we've always looked at uh, commercials, the commercial sector, the commercial zoning as jobs. And uh, so this, this remote movement to remote um, uh, work is changing that paradigm. So office space doesn't equal jobs because we have so many people working from home. So I think that we need to look at how we do that in a way, how we create commercial spaces in a way that supports both in office jobs, but also people who are working from home and and how that works from a shared shared space not a not a we work shared space but um, a company that uh, sheds uh, square footage in 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 that kind of space so I think that you know I'm I'm glad that the planning board is here uh, because I think that we the, the whole zoning of commercial space and looking at how commercial space interacts with residential space um, is really intriguing. And I think it's something that we need to take a hard look at. So uh, I think that's that's an issue. I uh, totally agree with uh, Council President on the utilization. I mean, that really is, um, you know, we're, we're all used to looking at vacancy rates, but you're the ones that really have the, um, uh, the anecdotal information about utilization. And so that is something that we need to really look at uh, for future. And the, the length of uh, leases and when those leases are coming up, I think is something that we need to pay close attention to. And we haven't really talked about the impact on the, the micro local economy, the restaurant industries and the retail industries. Uh, we've heard that here locally in Rockville uh, about coming back beca because the, our staff walk across the street and go to lunch. Um, they haven't done that in many years. And so um, I think it all kind of works together. Um, also intrigued by the, um, the tax abatement for um, lower income housing. I think, um, th uh, thank you, Mr. Carr, for bringing that up. Um, I think that that's something, again, we need to look at um, how does that fit with our zoning because these are uh, especially the, uh, I forget who mentioned it, um, the the issue of, and, and we've known this for years, the campus style office with the, the sea of parking, that is the thing of the past. Um, so, uh, but but that's also not where we want to put residents because residents don't want to live in 
campus style away from amenities. So I think that's going to be a, a, an interesting um, thing. Um, uh, we're supposed to be asking questions where we're, <laughs> we're doing more statements than questions. Uh, talent. So I think this is um, really important. We can capture the needs of our businesses who are here and come here because we have relationships with them and we can ask what their needs are. But we don't have, we don't have access to the ones that got away, right? Because we don't have a relationship with them, but you do. And so um, is there a mechanism uh, specifically on talent and skill sets that we can, whether it's through MCEDC, um, uh, most likely through MCDC, the, the interface of for if a com when a company doesn't come here because they don't see a talent pool, how can we get that information to know that information to make sure that we can prepare for the future? So I don't know what that communication is like. Um, so if somebody can address that, and I, I know that we have MCDC coming up, but that uh, communication back and forth so we know why real time why businesses don't choose to come here i don't know if anybody wants to talk about that at all everyone's saying no 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 <laughs> i'll just say that okay. it's public information in terms of occupation data mm -hmm. and so when we're doing national search um, selection We'll, we'll tap into the publicly available data. So for example, I mentioned manufacturing. Um, it's great to have PhDs, but in manufacturing locally, you also need lab technicians. And so we, we actually have the ability to just tap into the public information to see in each jurisdiction around the country how Montgomery County compares to others for that specific job. Mm -hmm. And then so it gets ranked. So, so if you have somebody that comes in and it's like, okay, we don't have that, do you convey that to MCDC to say, you know, we're getting a lot of the, there's a, we're getting a lot of no's because we don't have this, this talent pool? Probably not enough. It's usually mm -hmm. too late or, mm -hmm. or, or, or it's within the RFP uh, that goes out. Um, but that really goes hand in hand with the public private collaboration. And I agree with you there, there needs to be better communication on that front. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, and that's something we can talk about in the in the next panel. Yeah. yeah I, I would have two observations or responses to what you shared with us, um, Madam, Madam Council Member. One of which is, m much to my surprise, and perhaps uh, my fellow panelists, uh, there has been success in repurposing uh, suburban office parks, and we need to look no further than Rock Spring Park, mm -hmm. where Egan Young and Tob. I, I was shocked that they took <coughs> office land and and constructed uh, very high-end townhomes. And the good folks at EYA will tell you that's one of their most successful mm -hmm. projects. Then directly across the street, and this is a massive win that I think we should be promoting more, Marriott moves out of an 800,000 square foot battleship of a building, which could, and, and, and prop, I would have predicted, would still be sitting there vacant. Mm -hmm. They moved to downtown Bethesda and purpose built a new headquarters. We've addressed that. But now that building, the battleship's being torn down and high to mid rise, probably high rise would be qualified for this county. Um, senior housing is being built there. Yeah. So nobody could have predicted that. So I, I think that's a, that's, a, uh, that's a win for the county that needs to be more publicized. Uh, and then my other observation uh, deals with uh, Montgomery College, which is a top 10 community college in the country. I believe the most recent rankings mm -hmm. had them at number nine. Uh, I'm on the, the foundation board there. They Montgomery College is open to insight and guidance on what sorts of programs they should be having for instruction that the panelist clients want to hire those people. So are, are some of their programs antiquated or not meeting the needs of the prospects that are cycling through Montgomery County looking to occupy. I, I don't know the, re, the the answer to that. I have a suspicion now. So perhaps more collaboration with Montgomery College. Okay, thanks. I think that's something that we can look at um, yeah. together with MCDC and with you. So thank you all very much. 
Uh, and I love that you mentioned Rock Spring. I worked on that master plan when I was on the planning board and approved the e EYA uh, development, and it's you're right on target, very successful. Um, and then with Montgomery College, you'll see them in one of our sessions uh, in the future, especially on the sports industry, uh, making sure that we're building that talent in that particular industry that we really don't talk about in Montgomery County. So stay tuned. Uh, we have a last very quick question uh, from Council Member Lukey. Promise, this will be quick, and it's right on the heels of what you were just saying. So, um, and I know Mr. Tompkins is aware of this because we talked about this, oh gosh, over a year ago. But one of the things that's really challenging for me to see is where we as a county fit in the overall dual enrollment profile for our students at MCPS. Um, and it's, it's, it's known, uh, I can point to an article, a longitudinal study examining dual enrollment as a strategy for easing the transition to college and career for emerging adults, right? Having dual enrollment prepares you for success in the workforce and in higher ed. Our state average for the 2020-2021 um, dual enrollment figure is 7.2%. Our neighboring jurisdictions, PG, came in just higher than MoCo. Howard County was at oh, almost 14%. Carroll at 11.5%. And Frederick County at 15.25%. Montgomery County's number, 3.5%. That's it for our participants in dual enrollment. And I think that's significant, especially when you're talking about being able to determine by NAICS codes and everything else, where are our graduates going? What industries are they going in? What's the pipeline looking for? That that is incredibly significant in the overall development of business um, and attracting business to this county to fill up all these, all these spaces. Um, but my question is, what is the time or length of the financial uh, agreements for commercial real estate? What is the average financing agreement length? Because you raise that as a as an indicator of why redevelopment in certain um, aspects is not financially feasible and doesn't pencil out um, the the answer that'll make me sound like a lawyer is that it depends that's okay I am um, a lawyer <laughs> you, know, uh, it, you know it depends on the investment strategy of sure. the developer themselves if it's somebody local like Wilco um, you know, we're looking to repurpose it and still have a vehicle um, that allows us to hold it long term. So, right. uh, you know, whether it's if we're looking to repurpose an office building into residential, we're looking at a probably a five year construction loan. And then we would have to refinance into a permanent loan that we would typically look anywhere from, you know, as little as 15 years, as much as 30. Right. But that's probably not even available in today's economy. So right. um, other developers who are more speculative builders um I, I won't speculate on them but uh <laughs> you know it's it's sort of it's different across the board okay yeah. but you're talking uh, you know it can be anywhere from if you're talking about the 15-year mortgage if you will post yeah. five-year construction loan to a 20-year to a 35-year range and again it all depends on on financial feasibility so yeah. if if the interest rates are in a high environment mm -hmm. it's probably going to be on the lower end or on right. the shorter side Right. Um, and we'll still continue to try to time it so that we can eventually structure a longer term uh, horizon. Right, because you'll refinance it yep. when the interest rates drop, just like just like homeowners. That's right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for this great group of panelists. Uh, we truly appreciate sharing your wisdom and your experience, so we can take uh, we can find those solutions to move us forward. Stay tuned. Uh, with that report that we're going to be putting together to follow up on this discussion. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask the second panel to please come. And Mr. Bill Tompkins, man, we have a lot of questions for you, especially after this. Uh, we're going to be talking about business attraction, and I'm eager to learn from you what's your relationship with your brokers. You know, how often do you talk to them? All that great stuff. I uh, hope you are ready. And uh, we're going to take, it's, let me see the time. It's 11.13. I'm going to try to to be done with this panel by 12. I know it's half an hour after usual time, but uh, we're running late, and this is very important. So I hope it's OK. OK. That's OK? OK, perfect. Thank you. It's at 12.30. No. OK, better. Ms. Marlene, would you like to kick I, us I'm off? I'm just going to turn this right over to MCEDC. They have a presentation for you, so um, we'll let them get started. 
Thank you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. And as you can tell from the earlier panel, uh, we have a lot to cover, not just today, but throughout the uh, fall. Uh, the panel before us touched on a number of issues uh, that I think are critically important. So when we look at economic development, expansion of existing businesses is really important. Retention of existing businesses is our number one priority. But attraction is what gets all of the excitement and the sizzle because it means there's something new coming into the market. So as we go through these next sets of sessions, I think the work route will be important, but we're happy to come back to dive into more detail because I think that's what's gonna be required in terms of how we move the needle consistently. Today, and, I'm gonna- And just a quick reminder that we're gonna be focusing on business retention on October 9. Correct. So go ahead. Yeah, so starting out with business attraction, I have two of my colleagues here, Prayas Nupani, who joined us within the last year and is an expert in that area. He joined us from the District of Columbia, so he knows the region very well. And Brad Stewart, our Senior VP of Business Development. Prayas will do the presentation and we'll all answer questions. All right, th thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, really exciting to be here, and um, this is certainly the right time for us to be talking about business attraction efforts. Companies are still trying to decide what does a remote work policy look like, so I think this is definitely the right time for us to be reminding them why Montgomery County is a good place to do business. So with that said, I'm gonna jump into the presentation. Um, as you are aware, we have been tasked to attract businesses within certain strategic sectors which includes life sciences, technology, nonprofit headquarters, hospitality, real estate, corporate head and corporate headquarters that are not within our strategic sectors. We've also been tasked uh, to foster entrepreneurship within those particular industries, as well as supporting women-owned, minority-owned, and underserved businesses within the target industries. And one of the ways we do that is we have a dedicated staff that focuses on each of these industries, and their, their goal is to understand the current ecosystem, but also be in tune with what's happening outside of Montgomery County, uh, what's happening in that sector, what companies are growing, and creating a plan to attract those, those companies here. So within our strategic industries, um, we do a variety of things to attract companies. Uh, one of the key ways of doing that is attending industry trade shows. As you are aware, we attend um, trade shows like Select USA and Bio on a regular basis. And as an organization, we have been highly selective on what uh, trade shows to attend because we want to make sure that any conferences that we go to, we are in front of the decision makers. And based on that particular uh, b because of that, uh, there are a couple of the ones that we have gone on a regular basis, and these provide us with a valuable insights on what's happening in the industry, then which we bring back to Montgomery County and try to use that to strengthen our current ecosystem. And in addition to that, the trade shows are also important because we get to sit down uh, with the decision, make, uh, decision makers on one on one basis, and uh, we use this to uh, nurture the relationship over the years. So, as you know, economic development is all about relationships, and for us to meet with a company and for them to think about expansion in Montgomery County, in county it takes a number of years. So for us, to going to a trade show is really just the starting, starting point where we meet with them, greet with them, help them understand the value proposition of why they should locate here and nurture that relationship over the years so that they, when they are thinking about expansion, they think about Montgomery County. And um, in addition to that, we're also constantly reaching out to companies that are now located here. Uh, we use various sources like PitchBook, CoStar to look at companies that are expanding, companies that have recently been acquired, companies that have recently merged, and reach out to them to say, hey, if you are thinking about expanding, we are here to support you, and we're, we, we can provide the assistance that you might need to, to grow in the area. Um, real estate is also another big component for us. Uh, we are in regular conversation with uh, brokers. Uh, some of the folks that were here today, we talk to them all the time about what's happening in the industry, but also to help them understand the resources they have. So for example, I was just talking to one of the, the brokers today and he, he mentioned he wasn't aware of the MOVE program. So that's the kind of conversation we have continuously throughout the year to let them know that we're here as a resource and there are programs in the county that helps you, that will help you close the deals. 
So th that happens on the broker engagement side. We also attend trade shows on a regular basis. So last year we atten attended ICSC um, in Las Vegas where we met with a lot of brokers that are operating outside of Montgomery County to understand what sort of deal flow are they, um, what sort of deal flow are they seeing, what are some of the concessions that are being offered, and what do we need to do to be competitive uh, for companies to, to come into this area. And um, in those uh, particular conferences, we also talk to the brokers that are in the market and connect them with brokers that are outside so that there is that cross-collaboration and when companies are looking to expand, they think about Montgomery County. And one of the valuable um, real estate um, sections that we focus on is site selector engagement. So out of everything that we do, um, site selectors are consultants that are that help global companies with their location strategies. Um, almost 40% of some of the larger investments in the U.S. involve site selector con uh, consultants. And uh, over the course of last um, couple of years, MCEDC had a, has done a good job of maintaining relationship with these site selectors. But this year particularly, we're trying to be hyper-aggressive in terms of making sure that these site selectors are aware of who we are as a county and the benefits that we offer. And I'll touch a little bit on how we're doing that in the next couple of slides. So you heard about this earlier today on what site selectors evaluate uh, when they are looking at a site and when they are working on a project. So one of the key things they look at is logistics, if they have access to the current, if they have access to customers, and how the local ecosystem is within the industry of their client. They, are, they also look at uh, infrastructure such as ports, railroads, interstate, and airports. We're fortunate that how we have three world-class airports in the area, so that does um, presents us in a favorable condition when it, when we compete with other areas. Uh, but um, but the fact that uh, you know our office market is very small sometimes presents as a disadvantage as well. The second um, is workforce. Access to talent has been the number one driving force for site selection over the course of the last five years. So site selectors look at if you have the, the current workforce as well as if you have educational institutions, universities um, that can train the workforce. And lastly, they look at the cost to not only hire the workforce, but also retain the workforce as well. Third is real estate. Um, we talked a little bit, a little bit about Class A building, trophy building. So that's some of the things that they really care about. So a lot of the site selectors are not necessarily thinking about Class B. They are m mostly only interested in Class A and trophy space at, at the moment. And if we have that available in the county, and if not, do we have land that is available to build? Next is bu business tax climate. Um, the site selectors are looking at overall tax environment, our tax rates, uh, the tax burden to their client, but they're also looking at total fees and permit requirements. So. In, in general all across not only the county but also what they have to do in the state as well. Um, economic incentives, I think uh, Pete mentioned earlier that it is just the cherry on top and that is what we have experienced. Economic incentives are important but that is not the driving force in site selection. However, having a competitive economic, advantage, economic incentive is always helpful in the final phases of the deal. Um, lastly, regulatory efficiency. And this has become extremely important in the last couple of years where businesses, once they decide to locate in a particular area, they want to get started as soon as possible, right? So the, the, the time it takes for them to sign the lease to, to get the use and occupancy permit is extremely important. And if we say that this takes six months, if we're able to deliver in six months, then that presents a very favorable environment. And often with site selectors, it's all about relationships. So once you get one deal done with them, their experience in that particular county is what makes them want to come back to you again so that you can compete on projects. Um, so one of the things that I mentioned time and time again is relationship. So our um, site selector strategy is really based on that. It's based on engagements. It's based on constantly reminding them why Montgomery County is a good place to be do business. So there are um, conferences where these site selectors come almost four or five times a year. Uh, we have developed relationship with the, the conference organizers, and um, when we go to these conferences, we're sitting down with the site selectors and showcasing our value proposition, showcasing our assets, uh, talking about our economy, highlighting some of the major employers we, we have, talking about our quality of life, so that they understand that 
we have everything that a major corporation might need. Um, we also constantly send them newsletters as well as email and talk to them through LinkedIn. Um, and a, a key example of that is if there's a major expansion that happens in Montgomery County, we'll reach out to them so that they know that there is economic activity in the region. So the more that they, you keep letting them know what's happening in the area, the more chances that when they are working on a, a project, they will give us a chance to uh, apply for the RFI. And lastly, uh, FAM tours. So we are planning on bringing multiple site selectors to Montgomery County uh, in the spring of next year so that they can see the vibrant ecosystem that we have of life sciences companies, meet with them directly to learn more about why they decided to open the business here and what, uh, what environment has enabled them to grow, but also so that they can see um, our quality of life and, um, and visit the parks that we have and other amenities as well. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to give you an example of how we talk about Montgomery County. So access to talent has been something that we have talked about uh, th throughout the session today, and we constantly remind people why we have the talent uh, that they require to do business here. So as a matter of fact, just over 34% of the adults who are 25 and over have master's degree. So we're a highly educated county, and that's something that we constantly uh, keep reminding the site selectors as well as decision makers. Uh, similarly, we do have top regional universities and local educational institutions, and um, this is something that uh, we have um, we've tried to share with the decision makers, C-suites, as well as site selectors to let them know that even though there might not be talent right now, we do have the institutions that are going to be producing talent in the future. Um, quality of life, um, and this has become extremely important in site selection, uh, mainly because the retaining talent uh, went from being something in, they would consider to the top most importance, and this has uh, been much more important since the pandemic as well. So part of our message to them is, if you, if you want a place where employer, employees want to live, work and play, Montgomery County is the right place because we do have some of the amenities that people look for which includes our um, education. So I know council member, you, you talked a little bit about how competitive we are in, in schools and um, education, and that's something that we relate to the site selector community on a regular basis. And lastly, diversity. Um, DEI and ESG has been uh, one of the most important things that have come out in the last five years in site selection. So every single project that we're currently working on does have a DEI component to that. So we're fortunate that three of uh, the most diverse uh, communities are located in Montgomery County, and um, that benefits us when we are applying for projects. Uh, and that's something that we, we share on a regular basis as well. And lastly, our um, business development efforts are supported by our marketing team. Uh, when we go to a trade show, um, they have targeted ads that's focused on why Montgomery County is a good place to be, do business. So whenever we meet with the executive or a site selector, it's not the first time they are hearing about Montgomery County since they have already been engaged in other ways. Um, likewise, we do, we do run various op-eds in uh, different economic development magazines like Site Selection Magazine, Area Development, focusing on particular industry, the strengths we have within those industries and why this is a good place to do business. And here are just some assets uh, that we have utilized in the past uh, to promote Montgomery County. So with that, um, I would welcome any questions that you might have and really appreciate you providing us an opportunity to talk about uh, business attraction. I, I really thank you for that presentation, but I left with more questions than anything else. This felt like a presentation that is very genetic. I, and I wanna see data. I wanna see on, you talked about trade shows. How many trade shows have you attended? What have you produced? in those shows, how many people you meet with. Uh, you also talk about different strategies. You have the trade shows, you have the meetings with a site, uh, consultants that you meet with. Which one is more productive? It's, it's if we, uh, those are the details that we need to understand in order for us to really move forward and see what else as a county we should be investing in. Um, so I, do you bring that data? That how many times you talk to brokers? Um, in the previous panel, they talk about the importance of trainings and, and the importance of um, affordability. 
um, in that was a mention here in um, so I I actually feel worried <laughs> maybe I'm the only one um, data we can't just talk with a narrative here and tell in telling us you know we're doing all these things without showing us what you're producing that's what we need uh, council uh, member Gonzalez F Fanny Gonzalez yes we collect all of that data we do put it in our quarterly and our semi-annual and annual reports down to type of contact. Uh, we did not think to bring that with us to you today, but we'll share all of that. Uh, we keep it current, uh, not only in terms of type of contact, but by industry. Uh, the list of contacts that we've made, uh, whether it's in person, whether it is a sales call, all of that is, is collected regularly. and We do evaluate that. What, what's your target in terms of attracting businesses here? What's your strategy? Where, where are you going? Sure. That's what we came here for. We, we specifically named this session Business Attraction. What are you doing on that end? Um, sure. I, I can talk about the side sector conferences that we're going to. So this year, we're going to three different side sector conferences. So there's a side sector con conference called Side Section Guild. And this is a guild members. They have just about 50 site selectors uh, members who are in charge of bringing companies throughout the country. And uh, we attend that conference with the hope of meeting with 20 to 25 different site selectors that are within our strategic sectors. And in those meetings, we, sh we talk to them about what is happening in Montgomery County, what are some of the benefits of locating here. Can you give me an example of a previous trade show that you have attended? How many companies you talked to? How many of them have actually moved to Montgomery County? And what was it that made them think, huh, Montgomery County is the place for us to move in? What is that thing that really caught their attention? Okay, then we, yeah, so uh, Brad Stewart with the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation. So I'll try and answer that. Um, the answer is there's not a simple answer. It's literally all of these things that we have to do. And most of our uh, journeys to getting a company to locate here are both multifaceted and multi-year. So uh, whether it's our relationships with site selectors who may be working on a specific project at that time or may not, uh, as Prius was talking about, our job is really to make sure that when they do have a project, they include us in that opportunity to respond to that RFP, to have an opportunity to compete. Um, that's one type of thing that we work on. Uh, to answer your question about that, not with numbers, but experience. Um, the challenges we usually have when it comes to site selectors who are looking at for big projects is usually twofold. It's one, either we don't have a facility that will work for them. Uh, it's not uncommon for them to look for property first. And this is a county that's very property constrained. There's a very limited number of um, empty greenfield spaces for people to build in Montgomery County. Um, sometimes if there's not property available, they'll reconsider what they're working on and reconfiguring it to a way that'll work differently. A good example of that is a project we worked on with Millipore Sigma, uh, who's building a beautiful new headquarters here in Montgomery County at Treville, a property next to the universities at Shady Grove. That originally was a project where they were looking for uh, about 20 acres of greenfield property to build a single story and a half manufacturing space. Uh, instead, now they're building several hundred square feet in a multi-story building. So um, these are multifaceted conversations. When we go to conferences, sometimes they're the first conversation we have with the business. Sometimes they're the seventh conversation we have with the business. Most of those times at conferences is an opportunity to expand our network outside of this county and outside of this region. Uh, when I'm at conferences like Bio, which is uh, one of the two ones we focus on in life sciences, probably 80% of the businesses we talk to there are not from this region. Uh, they're either from places, other places inside the United States where we're trying to uh, market. In many cases, this is marketing, not sales. Market Montgomery County and get them interested in it and understanding the workforce we have here, the type of businesses we have here, or their foreign countries. Uh, where we're trying to attract more of their peers here to Montgomery County. So uh, I think for us, it's a pretty good combination, both of marketing and sales that we do in business development. And it's also um, many of the projects we work on are multi-year in nature. So let me just elaborate on that. Take bio as an example. Uh, I think three or four of us went this past year. We met with 
Our target was to meet with uh, about 50 very specific companies. We had an entire list of who was coming, and so we profiled them based on which industries and sub-industries within life sciences made the most sense. We did both individual and group meetings, and um, I'm aware of, off the top of my head of four companies who have both, they're almost all international, not uh, companies here in the U.S. who are now in the process of both finishing visits or establishing relationships to open offices. So for each conference that we go to, we do have a very specific strategy uh, to look at what the opportunity is, and then we measure both short-term and long-term what that uh, payoff is coming back. Each industry is also very different. So we talked about the six strategic industries. They operate very differently from each other, and so the strategy for each one has to be specifically related to that. Um, you talked about statistics. I will share this with you. Uh, this will come out in our annual report. Last year, last fiscal year, for our net new uh, business leases from companies coming here, there was about 700,000 square feet of leased space, so we track also the number of jobs. There were about 500 jobs that were created from new businesses coming here. And by the way, it is attraction is very, very difficult. You heard everything that was talked about in the earlier panel, uh, both in terms of headwinds, not necessarily as much because of uh, return to work policies, because this has been a, uh, a pattern for a, a long time, before 2020, uh, and will continue to be as we recover in terms of what attracts companies here, whether it is one of the seven elements on, I think it's slide number seven. Uh, and we can go through each of those to tell you what we think the challenges are and the opportunities uh, that work best for us. Can you list the top three issues that the broker community has shared with you that they need help with in order for them to sign leases with companies to attract them? Top three issues that you hear from them. So let me separate this out. Attracting a company that's not in Montgomery County to Montgomery this County. Is, this, is, this is whole attraction. Yeah. This session is on business attraction. That's it. Yeah. So I'll tell you the top three things. Uh, and the first one has changed slightly, um, but that's generally a physical place to locate, uh, whether that's raw land or an existing building that is purposed for or can be repurposed for what they're using it for. That is, um, in life sciences, has changed dramatically for the better in the last three years. We actually have not only a product available, but a pipeline of product, which didn't exist before. Second is workforce. Um, that's very challenging for us. If you look in the biotech or life sciences space, we um, don't have adequate workforce for the companies that exist here today, even to expand, much less to extract, attract new companies here. And, and the third for that is certainty to time to occupancy. And so that was one of the points that Preyas made. Um, it's fine to tell a company that you're going to, it's gonna take six months for them to occupy the building, but their experience turns out to be 18 months. Um, they're incredibly disgruntled forever and always. Um, and it's that type of feedback that gets back to the site select community and others, which cause them simply to not offer us opportunities to compete uh, for businesses like that. So they compare us to uh, the people who are here who work in the site selector business, which is where a lot of attraction projects come from. Uh, it's a small community. They talk constantly with each other. Uh, they share information. Um, regulatory burden is a significant issue, but I don't want to lose track of the fact that it's also the certainty. Um, I come from the life sciences industry where I know the regulatory burden is very high I'm also certain of what my time frame is to get approval for something. I think we struggle on both of those issues here. So if you go back to Mr. Briskman, who mentioned, talked about uh, talent in particular, we have this access to the exact same databases that he uses, and we monitor that. We work with not just uh, Montgomery College and USG on where those shortages are, but the reason you saw us have the other universities in the region is because you can't just count on those two educational institutions to deal with the shortfall. We also project out uh, in terms of where we think there is gonna be demand going forward over the next 10 years. And in some cases, you can work on uh, changing the degrees that are focused on by the institutions here. But in other cases, what is really required 
is what was mentioned, giving people different skill sets as opposed to a PhD degree. As much as we talk about that, by the way, so many of those PhDs are behind closed walls. They are at NIH. And those PhDs are not necessarily gonna come out from that closed wall to go work for a life sciences company. So it's both an opportunity, but it's also a challenge. I'm gonna open it up to committee members. I'm gonna start uh, from my right, Council Member uh, Marilyn Belkin. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, let's stay on um, uh, talent for, for a minute. So um, as one of those PhDs, <laughs> That the, in the in the community, I, I think that um, I, I'm. We've been talking about talent for a long time, and I know that we have great partners with USG and with um, with Montgomery College, and um, I just feel like uh, we need to have a. And I know that it in terms of trying to turn a, a ocean liner, it's very difficult for higher education to. Uh, change curriculum uh, readily. I mean, it, that's a very difficult thing to do, um, and it, particularly at universities at Shady Grove because we have all the other uh, institutions. They're the ones making the decisions as to what's what's going to be there. Um, but I think that we, uh, um, I am, I am um, disappointed. It's too strong of a word. I do feel like we could be in better shape from a talent perspective because I think that uh, everybody in the county is um, understands that talent is an issue and uh, I feel like uh, the community the county leaders are are committed to trying to solve that issue so I think that that's something that we should focus on uh, in terms of how do we close that gap um, uh, and then I'm also um, interested in um, the database that, of, of talent that, that, that everybody looks at. Um, I think it would be worthwhile to take a really good look at that to see if the data reflected for Montgomery County is accurate. Um, and is it possible that there is a categorization or a coding that we have more skill sets but just not reflected in that database. I, I used that database a long time ago, um, but I, so I think that that's just worth a look-see because I just feel like when we look at um, the life science industry, uh, and I know we, we have to be um, one of the top five locations in the country in terms of talent um, anecdotally, and I just don't understand why we continue to say we don't have that talent. And I, I mean, you, you would know more than that. So, um, Mr. Stewart, if you could talk just a little bit about why that, why we have such a big gap in life sciences skill sets. Sure. Uh, so the uh, database you're talking about used to be called Jobs EQ. Uh, I think the current name is Burning Glass. It's mm -hmm. it's changed name several times. Uh, interestingly, we did a uh, Montgomery County Economic De Development did a research project for the University of Shady Grove, probably it was the beginning of the year, so it's been nine months ago now, to really look at that um, data and its impact uh, here in Montgomery County for future jobs mm -hmm. over the next five years or so, uh, both in technology and life sciences. So um, Dr. Kadavian has that. I'm sure if you ask her, she'd be happy to share it with you. Yeah. Um, I think that I think the database is as good as databases are. Whenever you try and label people as the thing uh, consistently, some of those things are gonna be wrong. You do see that we have a high number, or what they actually use the word called uh, location quotients, is the uh, density of different job uh, skill sets you have available in a county versus somewhere else. A one is equal to the national average. Uh, as an example, since my undergraduate degree is in microbiology, microbiology in Montgomery County, we have a 10, which means we have 10 times the number of microbiologists as average, uh, as mm -hmm. average across the United States. Um, that doesn't mean they're available for work to you. That's what's missing from that piece of information. Mm -hmm. When you go and try and hire a microbiologist here, um, or almost any job, if you go look and talk to the major employers in life sciences here, not only is there time to hire, significant, meaning these jobs stay open for six to 12 months. 
at an average salary now of life sciences in the state of Maryland of $140,000 a year. Uh, there's not an excess of talent available. There's also a gap in what skill sets those employees have versus what the employer needs. So there's a, a gap in how effective those employees are, how much money the companies have to invest on top of their salaries mm -hmm. to train them to be effective. That's quite challenging. The other thing we see is when we have manufacturers move into the area, uh, they ask where their talent's gonna come from, and quite honestly, it comes from their next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. So you see this trading of talent back and forth between companies at ever increasing salaries, but with not new talent coming in to that pipeline to soften uh, mm -hmm. that problem. So there have been uh, suggestions made. I've mentioned to this committee before that the Maryland Tech Council has worked to stand up a group called Biohub Maryland mm -hmm. to actually, um, uh, I sort of think of things as short, medium, and long term. Can you get MCPS to fix this problem tomorrow? Absolutely not. Uh, that's a 10-year yeah. problem. Uh, can you do it sooner with a, a University of Montgomery College, maybe in a few years, possibly? But that's an immediate term opportunity that the county hasn't acted upon yet. Uh, so probably at this time, you'll see that Frederick County is already moving forward with implementing that to continue to improve the talent they have there and continue to grow. So. I don't think it's sometimes lack of opportunity, sometimes it's lack of action. I think to just to add to that though, the demand for life sciences is growing, which is a good thing, mm -hmm. meaning there are more jobs and more jobs to fill. So you're chasing a number that's a good thing for Montgomery County, and that's why you're gonna have a talent pipeline challenge because it's not stagnant. It continues to grow, more companies are expanding here in that particular sector. But if you take technology, uh, the talent drain across the region is a major, major issue, not mm -hmm. just life sciences companies or high tech companies. Everybody needs a good technology person, a good software developer. And so we're competing in a region where there's a shortage across the board, and that's not unique to, to Montgomery County. In terms of comparing the statistics, we look very carefully at how also other jurisdictions uh, fare and, and what next codes they use to compare what they have versus what we do. So when we see that there is a difference, we go back and break out the next codes to mm -hmm. see if there's a dramatic difference. Mm -hmm. I would say in general, the trends are, are pretty much on, um, that we are not being misled by false information, uh, but the shortages are still here. Are they unique to Montgomery County? I would say in some cases, yes, but in most cases, no. Our bigger problem is that our population growth uh, in certain sectors is not where it needs to be, and our overall uh, job base and workforce is not where it needs to be. And we've really gotta make sure that as uh, people retire here, that we replace those retirees, and we're not doing that. So that we are, we're not providing a larger talent pipeline just looking at that number itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I think that's something that we wanna focus on is, is and we have been, we have, we just haven't solved it. <laughs> so I think that we need to, we all need to do that. And I th also think that, um, you know, certainty to market um, is is something that we've talked about for a long time. And, and hopefully we'll have some changes coming up soon with this new uh, uh, task, excuse me, task force that's looking at that. Um, I, and just last thing, going back to the prior discussion, uh, the repurposing buildings, um, and I and I think that um, we've been looking at that as a just a, a renovation of a building. After today, I'm I'm really looking at it as a demolition, rebuilding uh, of buildings. Um, do we have a pipeline of when you know of those kinds of properties that we think will come up for potential? Uh, redevelopment so when somebody comes to say I know a lot of these are long-term because they're looking two three years out when their lease is up somewhere around the country um, it's possible that it's like the uh, the old Marriott building we didn't know what was going to happen to it but that was certainly ripe for uh, demolition do we do we know what other building what other areas might be I can answer that. Uh, unless they submit an application to the planning department, we won't know. Is there a list? Uh, I see the, um, the acting director for the planning department here, Ms. Tanya Stern. Is, is it possible you can share the list of the, 
I mean, it will be on the pipeline. It's not going to, when somebody submits a sketch plan, that doesn't mean that they're going to actually do it. Uh, but maybe you can brief the committee on this. Tanya Stern, Acting Planning Director from the Planning Department. Uh, we were just chatting. Uh, this is actually a really good question. It's something that we can take a look at with our resource team. Mm -hmm. uh, we definitely, you know, we can certainly provide uh, data on the applications that are coming through the process, but I think, but that covers lots of different types of projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it is, it is an interesting question, and we can take a look at you know whether or not we can kind of tease out uh, what properties, uh, office properties, might be likely to um, be repurposed or uh, converted for some other uh, for, for some other use. So we can we can certainly take a look at that. Right, and I think that from the perspective of. Um, I don't need to know that information. The gentlemen that were here before. Um, uh, so I think that that's part of the communication of um, that you might not, it, you, you might not have had an application yet, most likely. But if they have properties that they're thinking, you know, this we're not going to be able to lease this. We're going to we're going to um, look at repurposing. I think that that's a piece when we're talking about the future, not only for um, potential commercial sites, but also on the other arm of potential um, residential sites. So I think that we need to have a better uh, communication, but thank you. Sure, um, and yeah. if I can just add one other thing, I think another big piece of that is figuring out what metrics uh, the property owners and you know burgers are looking yeah. at um, in terms of helping them decide whether or not these properties should come offline as office uses yeah. and realizing that many of the a lot of what we're talking about is proprietary um, and wouldn't want to be public anyway so thank you but anything that you can send to the committee uh, that'll be great on this topic okay thank Certainly. you so much uh, Council President Glass Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I uh, appreciate the comments and questions that you and Councilmember Balcom have, have asked. Uh, and so uh, I, a lot of the thoughts I had, you, you two had addressed. But uh, I'll, I'll just ask a straightforward question with regard to the presentation that we just had, kind of um, following the line of thought of Councilmember Balcom. Uh, as has been noted, the most important work of MCEDC is the outreach and retention. And the focus, which, which is very similar to the presentation we just had, and while we know that the outreach is the hardest part, right, getting people, getting organizations to come here, uh, we, we need to focus a lot of our energy on the retention. So what is the relationship and what are the conversations that MCEDC is having with everybody who just presented on the prior panel and their associated agencies and businesses? Sure, I guess we can all answer that. Uh, we work with just about everybody that you saw at this table and on the screen. The relationships vary, uh, but I'll turn that over to Brad because he spends more time on that day to day than I do. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll collectively speak to it as the real estate community is an incredibly valuable resource for us. One, to be honest, they're the most valuable network of information that we have. Uh, their job is literally to know what every potential business is going to do and uh, those sorts of things. So um, it's we have, a, I think, a really good communication uh, with all of them back and forth uh, to em share information, understand what's going on. Uh, we work with them all very frequently. If it's a developer, we want to try and understand what they're building, when it's going to be done, what type of space is going to be available, because we want assets that we can market to people. Um, we frequently have requests for proposals for from site selectors looking for a certain type of site, a certain amount of square feet, and a certain date. So uh, we have to then reach out to those developers and say, do you want to participate in this opportunity, right? Here's what they're looking for. Does this fit your business purpose? And and uh, what you're interested in doing. So for us, it's important to understand that inventory of what's out there and what the timelines are. Um, and I think most importantly, we, we work with them. We have a shared goal, and that goal is to get people to sign leases to be here. Uh, so for us, it's sometimes a little awkward. Um, our, our role is to work with the company uh, and to make sure the company uh, wants to be here. The company is the one who receives incentives from the state and from the county and from the localities. Um, and so we end up having conversations with the company ourselves uh, on those perspectives. 
they're obviously having uh, discussions with the real estate uh, broker or landlord about how much they could pay in rent, how much do how many dollars they get in tenant improvements when they're ocup occupy the t term of lease and those sorts of things. So uh, I think we work very hard to have good relationships with them. And and when those conversations happen, and uh, one of the, the, the panelists mentioned that a, a piece of information that was asked about uh, comes at the, the end Typically, it's a, a lagging indicator, a lagging piece of information, and I presume that we want to try to get uh, the front end and leading information as quickly as possible. But when you get that information, what then happens? Uh, because of the nature of MCEDC uh, being a quasi-governmental agency, for lack of a better term, uh, you're not directly within any of the, the uh, county functions. And so when you pick up the phone and, and are asked about a piece of property or about any permitting or regulatory changes that a business would ask for, who then do you go to? Uh, so if, if it's a planning issue, permitting issue, I pick up the phone and I talk to them. Uh, we'll immediately reach out to the planning department, um, reach out to the permitting department, uh, ask for help, ask to understand what's going on. Uh, frequently the county executive's office is involved, whether it's someone on Jake's team, um, uh, without using names, although it's not, not private information. Um, you know, we had a large company who was building a... And, and Mr. Weissman is, is back here listening, so... Oh, no, I'm talking... I know, Jake. Full Jake's disclosure. Here, I'm, not, I'm talking about brand names of companies. Oh, got <laughs> is it. what I meant. <laughs> um, you know, they have a team of people who work with the, in the regional service center, so there may be very well times that, you know, someone's having a pro project, the per uh, problem with the project, the person in the regional service center is involved with it. Someone asks us to get involved. Usually it's the um, company uh, who asks us. And uh, we'll get involved. We've had those cases where we sit down and have bring everyone in the room, whether it's permitting, planning, the developer, the landlord, um, and the company who's leasing the property. Um, sometimes it's just helping to smooth communication, um, you know, because there's six different people having six different conversations, and not everyone wants to sort of take responsibility for the challenges that they've caused. And that's not always the county. Uh, that sometimes is developer or some sort of somebody in the construction or trades, but. I think we have a great relationship. Uh, there was a large project this past year. One of the federal agencies was considering leaving. Um, first people we picked up the phone and talked to were Judy Costello and the county executive's office uh, and started working on that immediately. <laughs> and so uh, she gets very engaged with a lot of these projects with us to make sure that uh, not only what what we're trying to do, uh, that the county executive's team is behind us and is fully engaged on the same page. Um, I'll ask a question and, and understand the nature of what I'm asking, but is that the most optimal situation? No. And the reason it's not optimal is by the time problems get to us, they're a really big problem. Mm -hmm. And that's why I ask. Yeah. And not and only are they a really big problem, they're the exception. It's the really big projects that have really big problems that get to us. But here's what we do to counter that because we're not necessarily going to change ourselves the system it's are we on the ground floor of the discussions for things that are coming down the pike coming down the road uh, so as an example uh, the learner corporation is working on a major project you have not heard about it yet because they want to make sure that all the ducks are in the row before they start anything in terms of how the state's going to respond whether it's infrastructure needs. So we're working with them now on what is going to happen. Same thing is true for Federal Realty, who is finishing out a major project, which you're very familiar with. But before they go to the next steps, we are talking to them now about how to pull everything together before something happens or goes wrong. So it's not always negative. It's really pre-planning. And then we track all of this uh, on a regular basis to make sure that these projects are moving forward. If there was an obstacle, did we overcome the obstacle? Who else did you have to get involved? So th there's a very long list, and the answer is not always the same. Yeah, uh, and um, are you all involved in the working group with the county? No, we asked to be, but uh, we're working through our friend in the back of the room, Mr. Weissman. He's yeah. assured us that uh, every from his organization's point of view, they have representation there. I read the reports. Uh, to make sure that the input is being provided. And as Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez said, there's 
good stuff coming out of there. I would say that it's still a challenge because of the way we are structured as, and so fixing those things without dramatic changes is something that I'll leave to the experts. Sure. But the answer is, yeah, we understand exactly what the challenges are and the things, some things you can overcome, some things are still, are, you have to change the DNA. Yeah. It's not just that the rules may exist, by the way. Well. Uh, you're in good company. I wish the council had more representation on that as well, but we are where we are and we'll uh, receive the report out when it comes. Um, but I want to put a pin on this. We need to dive deeper into it uh, and probably the most appropriate time is when that work group comes out, uh, although that I know is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and so in the in the same vein as uh, cutting red tape and streamlining processes, there are processes here um, that we need to refine better. So uh, thank you. I look forward to more of this. Thank you. And by the way, that, that report from the work group, I had a meeting with uh, Delegate Leslie Lopez, who initiated all this, and the report is going to come out in October. Um, so uh, Council Member Lorraine Sills. All right. Thank you. Um, so speaking about the stakeholders that were just here and you know, it's always about who's not in the room and we're talking about the education needs. Um, I know that the Board of Education's Collaboration Board for Career and Technology Education um, advises the Board of Education and the Board of Trustees of Montgomery College on a lot of the issues that are before us today. Um, but how are these discussions happening within MCEDC? And I know that you all meet monthly. Are we inviting these brokerage firms? I know that um, Mr. Weissman is also involved in those monthly meetings. And so, um, you know, as the Economic Development Committee, I don't know what the timeline is for this uh, task force report, who's involved, but I'm surprised and um, very disappointed to hear that the MCDC, um, kind of the cornerstone of this whole operation, isn't a part of this, so I'm a bit confused. And I don't know if Mr. Weissman wants to um, contribute to that, but if you want to answer that first question I have. Are you referring to the work group? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's the state delegate, Leslie Sorry. Lopez, the work group that she put together after Senator Kramer came with his bill, and uh, that work group was formed. Uh, we had a discussion here as a full council about it, and um, so it was the state, uh, the legislation who decided who was going to be part of it, mm -hmm. and um, and there are several members, and um, and the meetings are are open to the public. There are two coming up, and then again the last one is October. But we had we were briefed about this. Yeah. Okay. I no, I'm surprised that our economic development corporation is not a part of it as an economic development discussion as the conveners of bringing business, attracting, retaining, and growing. So that, that's a concern that we should all share. Well, we, we did ask to participate, and but we were under the impression that through the people who are represented in the work group that our uh, point of view would be heard. And frankly, I don't have to sit at the table as long as I know that the point of view is getting across. If it's being through you, that's fine with me because I know you represent us well. It's DPS is there, different agencies are involved. Um, yeah, but, we, but no one from our... We, we didn't choose who could be there. Exactly. It wasn't our decision. No, that's, I'm not disputing who made the decision, but a discussion about economic development, not having members of this committee or this body is of concern. So that's what I wanted to clarify. And so speaking about the educational needs, the gaps that the brokerage firms um, highlighted, and knowing that we try to convene stakeholders during these economic development discussions, what do those partnerships look like when sure. we are talking about these? We have partnerships coming out of our ears. Some are effective and some are not as effective. So just remember that WorkSource Montgomery is co-located in our office. Yeah. Uh, we meet with them at multiple levels uh, weekly. Uh, I also sit on the Workforce Advisory Board and we actually, I'm on the committee that looks at 
uh, workforce needs in particular industries, hospitality and life sciences. So that's one very strong connection as a very small example. Uh, Joe Hurst, who is one of our business development uh, managers on our staff, is dedicated what percent of his time? Seventy percent. Seventy percent of his time to looking at what the workforce needs are and what the communication is between the demand side and the supply side. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I am involved with uh, USG on many, many different activities that they have, but I also want to reinforce the fact that we can't just look at the three institutions that are here, I USG, uh, Montgomery, Montgomery College, College, and MCPS. And MCPS. Yeah. You know, I would, you, you got to take advantage of being in the DMV. It's not always all about Montgomery County, Maryland. We are here because we're also part of the DMV. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Johns Hopkins or the University of Maryland outside of USG, or Howard University, or George Washington yeah. University, you know what, it only takes 20 minutes to get to those places. So who cares whether they are located within our borders or not? Mm -hmm. They are for us. Mm -hmm. And we need to spend as much time looking at the talent that they are developing that is relevant to us uh, as we do the institutions that we always bring up. So let's not be too close-minded about thinking it's all Montgomery County. If you look at the assets in the region, it is also about taking what is there that we can't deliver on and not feel bad about it. Uh, a lot of people comment on whether or not, now I'm moving out of the lane a little bit, but I think this is an important fact, important piece of information. People talk about the fact that Montgomery County lost Amazon HQ2. We were lucky to be in the running, but guess what? Because it came to the region, we won. Because of the talent that it is attracting to this region, they are not gonna work at Amazon forever, number one. Number two, Amazon has a bigger name than Montgomery County, for better or worse. So when you look on a national stage about the companies that are here or that are spending time in this region, that is a benefit to us. They're bringing the resources. Our job is then, when the door is open, to then go and make sure that we are parroting the benefits of why you should be here versus over there. And that's where, as it was said earlier, with all of the assets we talk about, we do have a great story to tell. Yeah, so I'm not, I wasn't just referring to um, MCPS, mm -hmm. but all of our academic institutions in the region and just trying to better understand how MCDC is engaging with those other partners. How are we reaching out to the HBCUs all across the state of Maryland? Um, you know, the right across the river, there are talented um, institutions that, you know, George Mason. So we have all sorts of educational places that are um, expanding their academic programs, especially in the areas that we have interest in. So just wanted to better understand how we are partnering with those institutions on a regular basis to promote the needs of the businesses that are locating here or want to locate here, uh, but can't because of the uh, lack of talent. Um, and then I had another question about um, the work between MCDC and the Business Center. I know that it's um, expanded to the Small Business Center, and so just want to understand how that relationship is going, and if you can sure. share. Well, Gene Smith is not here today, so I think you want to ask him the same question, uh, although Jake is here, his boss. Um, we spend a lot of time with the Business Center and that's because we are integrated partners. So if you look at especially business to business and non-strategic industries, when we run into those businesses, we're not gonna let them go and say, we don't know what you should do. We are gonna refer them, not just refer them to, but work with the business center to make sure that the experience is as complete as possible and vice versa. Because the business center gets a lot of input and uh, they get requests that are for us. And so the dialogue with our business development team is ongoing, it's, I, it is on a daily basis. Okay. Uh, at every level, I am very pleased with the relationship we have, but I think you should also ask Mr. Weissman and Mr. Smith. Definitely, I guess that will be, okay, he's on his way down. And then I have a question about marketing. 
to finish up after Mr. Weissman. I'll, I'll just be very quick, Council Member. For the record, <laughs> Jake Weissman, Assistant Chief Administrative Officer for the County Executive. Apologies for not wearing a tie. I was not planning on testifying today. Uh, I would just second uh, what Mr. Tompkins said. We're appreciative of the uh, renewed uh, collaboration between our organizations and I think what's important to keep in mind is the strategic plan that the council passed last year specifically lays out a no wrong door policy for county government and its partners, which specifically delineates that no matter who gets contacted, whether it's a county agency, one of our partners in planning or uh, MCEDC or wherever, they are to ensure that those businesses get assisted and uh, we've been appreciative for that. Thank you. Thank you. And then my last question is about the marketing materials. I know the uh, Be Next, I saw a commercial for it on the news the other night. Um, how are we tracking the return on that investment and how long is that campaign gonna run for? Sure, uh, there are multiple aspects to that campaign. I'm gonna back up for a second that we have multiple marketing efforts, it's not just Be Next. Be mm -hmm. Next is the branding piece of what mm -hmm. we do to try to get people thinking about what do you think about when you think about Montgomery County? And if we had more time, I would play our branding video where people from David Marriott to uh, uh, Ken Mills talk about why you want to be next in Montgomery County. Uh, so it's based on a combination of reach frequency, uh, based on um, attitudinal awareness in terms of surveys uh, that uh, we are in the process actually of conducting for that campaign to figure out which pieces of it will continue uh, going forward. We didn't just do it for it to be a one-time initiative. The assumption was that if the brand of Montgomery County continues to build in a positive way, then we want to spend more money on that in terms of being effective. So for that campaign, we have about six or seven different measures. Uh, actually, that will be in our annual report also, but we mm -hmm. can share that with you tomorrow. Uh, and so is this like an in-house designer or how do you engage with what they're going to be producing? Well, it's in transition and I'll tell okay. you, explain why. So when we put that together, we went to multiple stakeholders in terms, including members of the county executive's office. There were a few council members who participated, businesses, the list goes on in terms of what is it that we need? What problem are we trying to solve? Mm -hmm. And what are the key issues? We interviewed 1500 people. And then we hired a professional agency to de develop the very specific strategies to develop the elements of the strategy, the media plan, the creative, and so forth. Uh, where we are now is that uh, we, since we have a pretty good feel for what works and what doesn't, uh, and what I mean by what doesn't is that you, we went too broad and we really need to narrow our focus because we used too many different types of mediums without enough punch, mm -hmm. but we saw which ones worked well for us um, uh, in a cost-effective way because it's not a, it's expensive to do branding campaigns. Yeah. Um, whether we continue doing all of that internally, uh, I think with the creative we have, we feel pretty good about media placement and our capabilities uh, with the partners we have, whether it be at iHeartRadio or whether it be through the um, USA 9 network uh, it will continue, but it will continue in a form that is more focused. Our, as you will see when we come up before the budget, when we talk about attraction, most of that branding is tied to this market and to getting everybody on the same page here so that people stop complaining about Montgomery County, but instead shaking their heads, yes, I can be next here. Uh, the next challenge will be how we then look at focused markets whether it's for life sciences or technology outside of this region and effectively go after those markets in addition to what we're doing when we go to a trade show in a particular region. It's a great opportunity to attract businesses here now in the Bay Area. The Bay Area is falling apart in some ways and the areas where it's falling apart are ideal for us. So how do we then find the right marketing dollars and of course the sales impact to go into that market and effectively slice out if it's just 10 companies that we get that's a big deal yeah i think i'm just concerned about some of these marketing materials and i don't know how we can collaborate mm -hmm. on the marketing materials before they are actually produced but you know like this unlocking your full potential in business and there's a football team um you know this 
I'm just wondering who's thinking about these things as they're going out, who's approving them, and how are they being evaluated by this body that's supposed to oversee all of the funding capabilities for MCDC, so. Uh, I'm gonna interject really quickly, and also I'm gonna move things along too. Uh, uh, Dalia Lutke, you have a question too, right? After this? Yeah, just yeah. a quick one. And just on that point from uh, Council Member Sales, we do have a representative from the County Council to the Montgomery County Economic Development uh, com uh, Corporation, and that's Council Member Marilyn Balcom, uh, who actually sits on their board, and, and, and it's part of these discussions and, and, and approvals. Would you like to mention or well, share I, any? I attend those as well, but I, I don't know if we necessarily weigh in on the marketing. S can as you campaign. as the representative I, can I can I can give my opinion I, I I personally am not a marketing expert I don't feel like that's something that the County Council should have oversight over the marketing materials from MCDC okay um, thank you and you do attend their meetings I do <laughs> yeah I, I also attend the meetings and I do have a background in marketing communications and if we're not seeing the return on our investment when we're putting our money in there, and we work with businesses, we talk with businesses all the time about what brings them to our community. We see trade shows. We've been to the conferences at MAKO to see what's being produced, and so we should be able to weigh in if we have concerns about what's being marketed about our economic incentives. So. I encourage. Did you want to? Yeah, and, Thank and you. I had the same conversation with Council President Glass, that you're also professionals and human beings, and if you have a reaction or a thought that's going to help us, don't hesitate to yeah. say, "Look, here's what I saw. This was great," or "Here's what I saw. Help me with this." Uh, please do not hesitate uh, to of do that. Course. But I would say, in terms of a general body, we would uh, we did preview the. Be next campaign with anybody on the council who wanted to participate. This goes back a year now. Okay. Um, I did just find out that the be next ad that you were looking at with the football team was for the commander's yearbook. <laughs> so that's why there is football in the background. Yes. So yes, I, I would love to uh, be able to view any upcoming um, ad campaigns that you are releasing. Perhaps we can follow up with council member sales in your office so she can have a, a meeting with your marketing team and have a preview. That would we be would great. love to do that. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, council member Lutke. Sure, just uh, just quickly, and this I, I apologize because this goes all the way back to you at the beginning. Um, you know, we were talking about the importance of networking and connecting in the different conferences and, and trade shows and things that you all go out to. Um, and so, you know, I was intrigued by that. So I looked at the Site Selectors Guild um, to just so kind of see, you know, and I know you already had that conference for this year. It has an agenda for the next year, but doesn't have last year's agenda, but it talks about table talk. And I was like, kind of looking at the format. Is that like speed dating for marketing? So that's exactly like speed okay. dating. So for table okay. talks, site selectors go around the table. You s sit in your table and they come to you to talk about your particular county and why, is the, why companies should look at there. So talk to, I mean, obviously networking is a crucial part of every mm -hmm. conference. You know, we attend, you all attend, um, that relationship piece of it cannot be denied. But but in terms of substantive mm -hmm. stuff, right, outside the, the, the handshaking and the business card exchanging, aside from these types of like, give me your elevator pitch type of thing, what level of um, more in the weeds work gets done at these conferences that, that assists with your mission? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for, for the site selector conferences, uh, especially during table talks, we're having conversation about a particular site. So if we okay. know that the site selector works on life sciences, then we'll talk to them, talk to them about, here is the, the total real estate that is being built in Montgomery County, and here are the companies that are located here, and right. here's the kind of innovation that we're seeing here. Right? So all that to educate them in terms of why this is a good place for life sciences companies. So when the next, when they're working on, on a next client who might be a life sciences, then they'll come to us and at least provide us with an opportunity to respond to a RFI, which is all mm -hmm. we ask for with site sure. selectors. So how many different, like at the, like the one you went to in March, mm -hmm. how many different 
industries were you able to pitch? I know life sciences, obviously, is a big one for us, but how many other types of industries were you able to pitch? So f this is going to be my first one from Montgomery County. I was in Washington, D.C. before, so okay. when wa I was in Washington, D.C., uh, there were three industries that we were focused on at that point, and I, uh, my job was specifically to find outside selectors that focuses on those three industries and pitch them on those three industries. Okay, can you let Madam Chair know what the, what the top hits are going to be for the 2024 uh, conference since you're new to our, our region? Um, Absolutely. Thank so, you. So those are going to be focused on the strategic industries that we have. So uh, our job is, to going to, is going to be able to figure out who are the site selectors that focus on life sciences, technology, hospitality, and corporate SQs. Um, and once we have an idea of who they are, then we're going to build a relationship with them throughout the year um, by talking to them on email, newsletter, phone calls, LinkedIn messages, whatever it might be, so mm -hmm. that they know who we are. And I'll give you an example for why that's important. Mm -hmm. So when I was in Washington DC, this is about four years ago, um, a site selector came to me and said, hey, I want, I want to, I have a project for the DMV area. Who should I talk to in Maryland? So they didn't have a point of contact here at Montgomery County at that point, right? So that's the kind of thing that we're trying to change is when a site selector looks at a particular project, they look at the larger area first. They look at the DMV market, then they look at the MSA, and then they look at the local county level. And at that point, we want to uh, be there for them so that they know uh, we can provide them with the information that they need. So, um, and one other more specific question about the technology sector in, in particular, because it's, you know, technology is a big, broad umbrella. Um, and, and obviously we have certain niche industries that are critical to Maryland, like cybersecurity and NSA and, and you know, interacting people that work to and provide contracting services to those federal agencies that are housed in and around um, the DC metro area. But, but what is our niche market in technology that makes Montgomery County mm -hmm. stand out different from our neighbors? Brad, do you want to answer that? That's a good question with a difficult answer. Uh, you're exactly right that technology is a huge number of different things, and there's a lot of it we don't do here. We don't do consumer electronics. Right. We don't do things like that. Um, we faced the same challenge in life sciences when I got here, because life sciences is a, is a thousand sub-industries. There's probably five we do well. Uh, in Montgomery County, we do a reasonably good job at cybersecurity. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of that is not uh, government-focused cybersecurity. Right. Um, most of that occurs in places that have dark fiber connections to NSA or CIA or other mm -hmm. places, which is why you see a lot in Howard County mm -hmm. and Arundel County. Uh, so for us, cybersecurity is important. Uh, we do have a reasonably sized defense industry, which we would consider right. technology. Uh, companies that support uh, work in that field like Rada Technologies up in Germantown. Um, we have autonomous vehicle companies here like Robotics Research up in Clarksburg who mm -hmm. does both military and non-military vehicles. Um, and then we have a lot of service providers. Uh, so that right. is really a huge amount of what we see here are people who are doing IT consulting, IT support, right. uh, government contractors, uh, those sorts of people. Uh, so that's it. Um, back to your question about when we go to trade shows or mm -hmm. beyond the networking, mm -hmm. we also look for uh, companies or organizations that are going to create the domino effect. Mm -hmm. So, for mm -hmm. instance, at Bio, where there were 23,000 people there, is that about right? That's pretty big. Or 18,000, right. I'm sorry, 18,000. It's like, where do you start? Well, going back to the list, there happens to be a company that focuses on SBIR and STTR grants. And that's part of our backyard. Right. So we met right. with that company to look at what their portfolio looks like across the United States in terms of their client base. And then that helps us because it's not just us, it's that company operating on our behalf. When we go to Select USA, uh, for instance, that's a big part of our international strategy. So we look at the places where we've already been because mm -hmm. we're making those investments, whether it be Taiwan, upcoming India, Vietnam, South Korea, what companies that are there are in those specific countries right. such that since we've picked them as a target, we have a much broader list of companies to work on in terms of attraction efforts. Just two small examples. Yep, got it. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. All right, folks. Thank you so much for 
being here today, the next session with the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation on business retention will be on October 9. Uh, meanwhile, I'll be meeting with uh, our team to follow up on everything that we discussed today and then share with the committee and get their views. Uh, we'll also follow up with you. Uh, at the end of the day, I think we, we all understand that we need to be very aggressive in increasing jobs in Montgomery County and working with all our partners to make sure that we don't just say that we have you know, a vibrant county, we do, but we, want, we need people to live and work here. So with that, thank you so much for your time, and we are adjourned.